All right, so we're here today. We're going, we're going to hear from our candidate, our candidate that speaks to our issues, that represents us all over this nation. And we have brought some distinguished organizers and leadership around here and around him to let him know that he has our support and we need his support in this hour. Okay, so once again, we have with presidential candidate, Dr. West, we have the Honorable Silas Mohammed, the leader of the Afro-descendant nation and a longtime pioneer for the teachings and the legacy of the Honorable Elijah Mohammed, a living legend in our midst, the Honorable Silas Mohammed. Let's give our dear apostles, give the dear apostle a round of applause. We have of uh, the former uh, national leader of Encobra. He's the current leader of Reparations United. He's fighting fiercely all over America, and he's fighting in the United Nations, in Geneva, Switzerland. He's in Africa. He is one of the strongest activists of our time, and he's certainly one of the leading reparations organizers in America. And I speak of our brother Cam Howard, the leader of Reparations United. Take a seat. There he is, brother Cam Howard. We have here to, uh, to my right, we have the leader of the National Reparations League. We, uh, he's a young man. He's a, a former professional basketball player overseas. I mean, he's seven feet tall. I mean, I, I haven't felt this, I have never felt this short <laughs> since I was in high school and I was um, on the basketball team going against big six foot 10 Leonard Taylor, but that's, a, that's another story. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see a man that represents the dedication of athletes to our struggle and is setting an example of what athletes could be and should be doing in our struggle. And he has uh, critical information. He has a reparations report card that he, he's gonna share with us briefly and, and we can get back into it. He and I have just returned from walking the halls of, of Congress, the Rayburn Building, the Longworth Building, the Russell uh, Office Building, where the congressmen and senators are, and he will tell you her himself what, what we just experienced while walking these halls of Congress because we have been engaged in lobbying for reparations, lobbying. And it was critical today as we went to Congressman Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee's office. We went to uh, Congressman Donald's, Brian Donald's from Florida office. We went to Mitch McConnell's office. Wouldn't you like to have been a fly on the wall to see big, well-dressed uh, Rashad Singleton at seven feet tall speaking to Mitch McConnell's staff and how shocked they were to see these strong brothers in there handling our business on Capitol Hill. We'll get to that in a moment. We have uh, the attorney who will be speaking, our attorney who will speak to us on behalf of the Afro-descendant nation. Her name is attorney uh, Harriet Abubakar, the queen mother of the Afro-descendant nation and the wife of the Honorable Silas Muhammad and a longtime human rights pioneer in her own right. Let's give her a round of applause from the very family of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Give her a round of applause. And we have a young sister attorney here also who will, who will have some brief remarks in the opening parts. Her attorney Reese Everson from the National Reparations League. Let's give her a round of applause. All right, and so uh, the purpose of our forum here is for Dr. Cornell West, our presidential candidate, to give a national policy statement. He's gonna give a national policy statement on, on his campaign and what it means on these critical issues that we're about to discuss today. We've heard and seen Dr. Cornell West on CNN, is that right? Yeah. And we've heard of his campaign. Mr. Hassan, I need you double time here, sir, right here. 
We've heard and seen him around the country, is that right? And we've heard bits and pieces of him, right? But it's time now that, that this candidate, and I wanna say our candidate, I will say my candidate, and I'll tell you that and why in a moment, but we want to hear his official positions on critical issues that are on the table in this hour, critical issues. Uh, and those critical issues are United States foreign policy, United States foreign policy, uh, United States foreign policy on the war against Gaza, what they call in the war in Gaza. We want to know specifically what does presidential candidate Cornell West what is his stance on U.S. foreign policy in Gaza? What is his stance on United on the uprising? Now y'all gonna get still in here one last time. We want reparations. Is that right? What do we want? And when do we want it? What do we want? And when do we want it? Our candidate today is going to speak to us clearly on United States foreign policy. He's going to speak clearly to us today on United States obligations for human rights under uh, treaties and conventions, and that it is signed at conventions and, and what obligations the United States supposedly has towards human rights in this country and in this world. We're going to hear today uh, Cornell West's position on the student uprising. We want to know, uh, does he what is his position on the uprising? We want to know this. Is, is Mr. Abdullah ready? Um, yes or no, fast. Yes or no? She's not ready to speak, but she is in the chat. You know? She's in the room. Okay, fine. As long as she's in the room and we ready. Okay. Okay, let's cue her up. When she's queued up, raise your hand because we'll, we'll stop the program and go right to her. Here she is. Okay, so sisters and brothers, what I'm going to do right now is make way for the vice presidential candidate of Dr. Corn of Dr. Cornell West. And we want to pay careful attention to this woman and this black woman here right now. Her name is Professor Melina Abdullah. Professor Melina Abdullah is the national leader of Black Lives Matter, the grassroots operation with chapters all over this country. She is perhaps the per perennial and the leading activist uh, uh, against police brutality and the Black Lives Matter movement anywhere in the country. Make no mistake about it that she is the only Muslim uh, vice presidential candidate or the only Muslim ever to appear on a presidential ticket in the history of the United States of America. And Dr. Cornel West picked her as his vice presidential candidate. He has picked a black woman. And let me tell you this, there's a long difference between the Honorable Kamala uh, Harris, the vice president, and this vice presidential pick. Right. We'll hear why in a few moments. She's in her car. Well, why is she in her car and not here? Because she is fighting this struggle in real time, not on paper. She is about to head into a trial against the Los Angeles uh, Police Department. She's been on trial for a week and has to appear before a judge right now because the police had attacked her home and her case has gone to trial and she's fighting in court. She has been fighting on the front lines with the student organizers at UCLA and USC when the police attack and the students arrested. I want you to hear right now, bring her back. I want you to hear right now from who we want to be the next vice president of the United States of America, a woman of truth and justice in the mold of Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and Angela Davis and uh, all of the other greats that have come before us, please welcome and receive the honorable uh, vice presidential candidate, Melina Abdullah. Please give her a strong round of applause. Good morning, salam alaikum. Can you all hear me? Yes. 
great, great. I'm so honored to be with you all this morning. Um, Brother Malik Zulu Shabazz, um, it's a blessing and an honor to be with you, even though it's only virtually. Um, Malik Zulu Shabazz and I go all the way back to our Howard University days, and I'm grateful um, to still be in righteous struggle alongside him as we talk about ending police brutality, ending the terror of police um, on our folks. Uh, most recently, Black Lives Matter Grassroots was honored to work alongside and continues to work alongside Attorney Shabazz around holding police in Mississippi accountable with the prosecution of those goon squad members, those white police officers who've been terrorizing Black community in Mississippi for generations. And um, we won a historic victory getting them convicted. And now we're working on ousting um, the sheriff there and doing additional work in Mississippi with Black Lives Matter Grassroots Mississippi. It's again also my deepest honor to be named as the vice presidential pick for Dr. Cornell West. And um, Attorney Shabazz and I can both attest to how um, influential Dr. West has been on our lives. Um, on my life as a scholar, as an undergrad um, at Howard University is when I first came in, in um, contact with Dr. West, was deeply, deeply inspired by his work. At that point, Race Matters had just been released and it was hugely influential on my work as a scholar as I went on to graduate school um, at University of Southern California and earned a PhD really studying Black politics and Black power. I wish I were there with you in person, but as Attorney Shabazz shared, I'm sitting in my car outside the courthouse in Los Angeles. We're in our second week of trial. It looked like for a moment we were going to be able to get a break today and I was going to be able to be with you in person, but unfortunately I have to um, be in court today. My child takes the stand today um, as we hold police accountable. LAPD swatted um, my home three times in 2020 and 2021. And what that is, is when um, there's a false call and then police respond with a really violent um, response. So they surrounded my home with assault rifles um, and had a helicopter overhead forced me out of my home at gunpoint. And all the time they knew that it was a false call. So it was meant to instill terror um, in um, the lives of myself and my children. And so we're saying they don't get to get away with that that they don't get to retaliate against us simply because they don't like that we're doing work to hold them accountable. And so this is in the name, this lawsuit is in the name of Michael Zinzin, is in the name of so many others who police attempt to terrorize and silence. We will not be silenced. And so that's what this trial is about. Of course, I wish I were with you in person. Um, again, it's my great honor to be the vice presidential um, candidate alongside Cornell West. I never anticipated ever, ever, ever running for office. Um, but Dr. West is such an inspiration and we want to encourage you all to understand that it's not just um, who he is as a philosopher, who he is as one of the greatest minds of our generation. It's not just what he thinks about and writes about, it's what he stands for. And so I'm so proud of our policy pillars, which are available at cornellwest2024.com, cornellwest2024.com. It is, what this campaign is about is really understanding that the world as it's presented to us doesn't have to be the world that we accept. We don't even have to accept what they tell us our choices are, right? So the powers that be, white supremacist, patriarchal, heteronormative capitalism tells us that the only choices that we have are between the embodiment of, of evil. That's what Donald Trump 
represents. He is the embodiment of evil. And then Joe Biden, who my children and others call Genocide Joe, is funding and fueling a genocide, killing tens of thousands of people in the immediate and, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in the long term. And we will not say that we're casting our ballots for either of them. And um, what this campaign is about is about saying we can choose something different. So we choose truth, justice, and love. Truth, justice, and love. The truth is that we could house everyone in this country if we weren't spending 62 cents out of every general fund dollar on the military, right? Out of every unrestricted dollar on the military, right? We could house everyone. We could have free higher education for all if we weren't spending our dollars on genocide. And so this campaign is about saying, what if we recaptured the resources that we had and used it for the benefit of our people? Then we could have real economic justice, which means a $27 an hour federal minimum wage. But it also means saying, look, there is generational harm that's come from a country that's built on the stolen land of indigenous people by the stolen labor and lives of our African ancestors through the system of chattel slavery. So economic justice absolutely requires reparations. And we mean real reparations. We mean, yes, the truth of telling how this country was built, but also we mean economic justice in the sense that if you stole which they did, the resources that came from our forebearers, then those goods have to be returned. Those resources have to be returned in the form of reparations. And so we mean real reparations. And I believe we're the only presidential ticket to say that we want real reparations. And under a West Abdullah presidency, we will have real reparations. We want to applaud the phenomenal work of Malik Zulu Shabazz, an Afro-descendant nation. Black Lives Matter Grassroots has joined um, the uh, many days long reparations conference, national reparations conference that's just wrapping up there in Washington, D.C., which we believe is just a beautiful um, sharing of ideas, sharing of commitment but also doing the actual work. And so reparations, accountability, remembering that um, we have to hold accountable, not only government, but also these corporations that have built their fortunes off the theft of labor and the theft of our resources. So I know there's gonna be additional accountability. I know that there's gonna be additional marches on some of these banks. And um, we know that there's been phenomenal work done by people like Ta-Nehisi Coates, right, who said, look, let's look at um, banks like Chase Bank. Let's look at Citibank. Let's look at Bank of America. Let's look at Wells Fargo, where I know that um, Attorney Shabazz is going to be leading in action tomorrow, I believe. And so that is so important. We believe in that kind of accountability. And that kind of accountability is being pushed all around this country. I'm actually sharing car space with um, one of my um, partners in the struggle and um, in doing this work, um, Brother Billion Godson of, of Africatown Coalition has been doing this kind of work here in Los Angeles where they protest these banks that have built their fortunes off the back of unpaid black labor. Um, they've been doing this work for years now, and now that work is beginning to take hold. And so, again, we are committed. Um, the West Abdullah ticket is committed to real reparations. We're committed to sanctions and to the restoration, the repaying of, as Randall Robinson called it, the debt that's owed. This is not a gift. We're not asking this is a debt that's owed to Black people. This is a debt that's owed to Black people. And so we are demanding that. And under a West Abdullah 
um, presidency, we will have, we, will, we are committed to real reparations for Black people. And so I'll stop there and just say again, thank you. And we look forward to continuing our work. Um, this campaign itself is also work. This is an opportunity for us to usher in the ideas and the, the different vision of the world that we all know that we want, need, and deserve, and we can have if we're willing to fight and struggle for it. Again, thank you so much. much. Salam alaikum. Uh, give her a strong hand. Give her a strong hand. I need more volume on my mic. I need more volume on this mic here. All right, good luck. Bless in court. Keep up the fight. Whichever way you are on the side of right, uh, Honorable Vice President, we thank you so much. Give her another round of applause. All right, uh, can can we make so Mr. Dante's can have a seat? I want him to be able to get a better shot. We're live on Instagram also. Let's turn off all phones, please. Turn all phones off, please, and don't let anyone through that door. Lock that door, please. Lock that door, please. Everybody's phone off. I hear somebody's phone ringing. All right, we packed in here. Give yourself a round of applause. Once again, we're here for a national policy speech from presidential candidate Cornell West, who is a lifetime struggler and legend in our community. We have a few pre-statements, brief statements from other leaders here, then we're gonna bring Dr. West on, and then we'll engage in a dialogue afterwards. But we are here to hear the man that is carrying our cause in this hour, carrying my cause and your cause in this hour. So uh, what I'm gonna do right now is, is to bring on um, a man from the Earn the black vote campaign. All right, he said. He says, "Earn the black vote," uh, uh, and we have a lot of questions about whether our vote is being taken for granted. Uh, we have a lot of questions about whether the black vote is being used and abused by both political parties. We have a, there's a lot of questions about Dr. West. Is he going to take votes from from the Democratic Party or the Republican Party? Or why is why is he in the race? Uh, you know, I got my strong opinions on these subject matters, but I've chosen to reserve all of my strong opinions on these subject matters. And I'm going to defer to my guests and to my candidate in this hour because I know that he's going to speak for me. And so therefore, I want to bring to you from Reparations United, Mr. Cam Howard, who will briefly explain uh, the Earn the Black Vote campaign and his striving for a federal reparations com commission that he's striving to get from President Joe Biden. Let's bring Mr. Cam Howard on. Thank you, Brother Minister, uh, Brother Malik. Uh, thank you, Dr. West, for your candidacy, candidacy. And thank you, Dr. Molina. I am Cam Howard. Uh, with Reparations United. Reparations United is the leading organization of a national collaborative, the Earn the Black Vote National Collaborative. Our primary goal is to extract a reparations commission by executive order from the president before the election. Last year, the company Resonate identified 2.9 million Black voters who voted for President Biden in 2020 say that they disapprove of him going into this next election. 2.9 million Black voters. That's 20 percent of the Black voters who voted in the election say they disapprove of President Biden. That number may have increased as a result of the Black voters' perception of Biden's handling of the Israeli-Palestine war, or it may have slightly decreased as Biden has taken it upon himself to specifically target the Black community at this particular time. But what we do know is that those who disapprove of him are saying they may not vote at all in November. Some are saying they may vote third party. Some are saying they may vote even for Trump. Those who are looking at a possible third party are overwhelmingly saying they're looking at Dr. West That's right. and Dr. Molina. Those disapproving Black voters are saying that the Black vote 
in fact, must be earned. They're tired of being taken for granted. Our votes are being taken for granted. They're tired of being forced to, as Dr. Molina say, choose between the lesser two evils. They're tired of being held fully accountable to saving this democracy, and yet we get nothing from this democracy. So in fact, they're saying in November, and they're saying it right now, that the black vote has to be earned. That's right. Reparations for centuries of crimes against our humanity, against our humanity have shown itself to be the leading issue for black Americans at this time. Student loan debt, voting rights, criminal justice reforms, all are contained within this demand for reparations. Black voters and activists have shown that there is demonstrated political will in America for reparations at this time. In the last Congress, 88% of Democrats in the House and Senate pledged their support for a reparations commission. Unheard of. Governors in the states with the three largest cities in America with the largest concentration of black voters have already established reparations commissions in their states, New York, California, and Illinois. Thousands of state and county and city elected officials are creating reparations commissions task force of subcommi subcommittees in over 100 cities and a half a dozen states at this current time. 80% of Democrats polled in 2019 said that they were either in favor of or unopposed to a reparations commission. Only 20% of Democrats polled at that time said they opposed a reparations commission. We think that that number is much lower five years later. 65% of, of Gen Z and millennials of all races favor a reparations commission. The political will for federal redress for Black Americans has been demonstrated across this country. During the Black Vote campaign, just completed a poll in Michigan that states that this issue will drive Black voters out in transformative levels, which is a term used by Congressman Sheila Jackson Lee when she read the results of our poll. Anyone desiring the Black vote at this time must earn the Black vote and must earn the black vote through reparations. This is the only path to victory for any candidate. And we thank Dr. West and, and Dr. Molina for standing up and saying that they too are pushing this issue of reparations forcefully. Thank you. Let's give him a strong hand. Let's give him a strong hand. Brother Fahim. All right, we have a great civil, we have one of the great national civil rights activists in the in the building, Mr. John Barnett. Let's give him a hand. All right. Okay, next up, as we push through so we can hear from Dr. Oh, this post. So we can push through and hear from Dr. West. I want you to hear from a uh, a, a former professional basketball player who has the leader of the National Reparations League, who was a co-sponsor of this weekend's great National Reparations Convention. This is the fourth day of our convention. Let's give the convention a strong hand. We've just come from lobbying on Capitol Hill. He has a National Reparations Report card. He's, he's a... He's a... He's a strong black man, about seven feet tall. All right, so let's bring him on to the rostrum. My brother and our brother, a young man in the hope of our future, Brother President Rashad Singleton of the National Reparations League. Let's receive it. Greetings, everyone. Greetings. Uh, first, give an honor to the Most High and Yeshaya, who is the head of my life, uh, give an honor to the Honorable uh, Silas Muhammad. It's a blessing to be in your presence and your beautiful wife as well. Uh, give an honor to the legendary Dr. West. I can't even believe I'm in the room right now. Can we please give a hand for Dr. Cornell West? Uh, brothers and sisters, as you just heard, uh, me and Brother Shabazz have just walked the halls of Congress. Throughout the whole building, we saw posters saying, I stand with Israel. 
I stand with Israel. I stand with Israel. We didn't see one poster that said, I stand for reparations. But the people stand for reparations. That's right. So we're here to say, we're no longer satisfied with the crumbs that this government has given us. We want the whole cake. You're not gonna satisfy us with just holidays. You're not gonna satisfy us with these tokens. Not Definitely not gonna satisfy us with empty apologies. We want the same thing that this government gave Japanese Americans, reparations. Same thing they gave Native Americans, reparations. Same thing they gave slave masters, reparations. They didn't give them voting rights as solutions. They didn't give them holiday, they gave them reparations. So if these other nations or people deserve reparations, then surely the people that built this country deserve reparations. Uh, we hear things such as the lesser of two evils. We we'll always say things like two heads of the same snake. And if you take the body of a snake and you spread it with two heads, ain't you gonna get bit if you move to the right and you gonna get bit if you move to the left. My people are tired of being bit. So if it takes a third party, then so be it. But one thing we will not be satisfied with is not having reparations. So we applaud Dr. Cornell West for taking a strong stance on reparations for he is the only candidate right now that has done so. That's right. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. So we, we we are grateful, brother. And, and as you continue to do this, we're going to hold these other politicians accountable. The National Reparation League has developed the reparation report card. You can go to this at the National Reparations League.com. We are grading politicians on their stance for reparations solely. We no longer care about you coming out and 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 and, and kissing black babies before your election time. We, we don't care about you coming to our black churches right before election time. We want reparations. We want reparations. We want reparations. And we're not just coming after the politicians. We will be coming after the businesses. Wells Fargo, Barclays Bank, the Catholic Church, University of Georgia. University of North Carolina, all institutions that have our ancestors' blood on their hands, we have found you guilty, and we will be boycotting you effective immediately. Thank you, Dr. Cornell West. Thank you, Audible Salas Muhammad. This is great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Come on, let's give him a further round of applause. Thanks. I tell him to keep standing because when they see him standing, he makes more men want to stand. That's right. All right. You can do better than that. All right, sisters and brothers, as we move this train down to hear from our keynote speaker today and the key, keynote speaker to all of America is being broadcast live right now over Dr. West's website, other websites, and national news media. And this speech, this broadcast will be studied today from the politicians and the scientists of America and this world about what is said today. Nations of the earth want to know, is there a moral voice coming out of America? Right. Is there any morality in America? Is there any hope coming out of America? But well, we want you to hear today that there is. But before that, we want you to hear from another black woman who is a legend in our struggle, a legend in our international struggle, one has, who has been fighting in the United Nations along with her husband, the Honorable Silas Muhammad. They've been fighting for years and years for our human rights and our dignity at the United Nations. And we want to let you know that our struggle is headed to the International Court of Justice, that same International Court of Justice that South Africa stood up for and condemned the genocide in Gaza. The same International Court is where this reparation struggle is headed. Let us receive now uh, one of the greats in our struggle, Attorney Harriet Abu Bakr, the wife of the Honorable Silas Mohammed. Let us hear from our queen. Greetings to all of our listening audience and to everyone present here today. I am representing my husband, the Honorable Silas Muhammad, but I'm also representing the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm. And in that, 
Really? Yeah, and and that since I was a little teenager, he took me under his wing. I had lost my parents, and he helped finish raising me up. So all of my life, I have been in this fight, and I am in this fight for the right reason. Today, we are coming together, and we are honoring Cornell West for having the courage to step out there and face this mighty foe that we're all against. And he has what it takes to do it, and he's going to do it. We, we as Muslims, have in the past never been too active with uh, politics, but it's not because we don't understand the, the power of po politics. That's why we aren't, because they haven't been doing anything for us. And they haven't been doing anything for black people. So why waste a vote on white people that are pushing their own agenda and never considering us? So now times have they have been a changing. Mm -hmm. And uh this we're not dealing with the same America that we were dealing with before. Now uh uh you're going to have to represent us all. We understand that. But it's our turn now. You can feel it in there, can't you? This is our turn, and what we want is reparations. And we have been more than patient in getting our reparations. So we have had books galore written on why we should be paid reparations. All of the legal and, and not legal reasons have been given to the world as to why we need our reparations paid. We've got to close that wealth gap. That's the main thing between us. And then go for self and do something that we as black people want to do for black people. And we can do that. We have the ability. Anybody with the fortitude to survive what our people have gone through for 500 years. Yes, ma'am certainly has the has what it takes to build our own nation now some of us are going to want to stay here in america uh we we built this so and so and we're going to stay here and enjoy some of it that's your choice if you want to leave because you're sick and tired of being held back because stay here or not you're going to be held back you know that all right uh that's your choice there are other African nations that may or may not have been involved in the slave trade, but some of them are realizing now that it would be better if we came back home, they call it. And some of us are going to want to do that, but under certain circumstances. Now, reparations is about negotiation. And we need to negotiate the terms of these reparations. Just don't use it as a blanket term, reparations. Reparations for us is going to be what we make it be. And, and don't get so carried away until you forget what's going on in the world around you. You see the wars taking place. If you watch what's going on in Israel, uh, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to know what could happen to us here. Let's be real. Let's address the elephant in the room. Yeah. All right? So then you have to start thinking like that. What if that happens to me? What is that happens to us? Because your, your uniform is going to be the color of your skin. And they don't care whether it's dark or in different shades of brown, or all the way light, bright, and damn near white, <laughs> you're going to have on a uniform. And no one's going to ask questions. You know, they'll do what they do and then ask questions. So we are here 
regardless to our political thoughts. And we have to be ready to face the truth of all of this. So I'm speaking on that on, on behalf of Afro-descendant nations because we've always been warriors. I pledged my life for this cause. We all have pledged our life for this cause. Yes, and whether you pledge it or not, you might have to give it up. Mm -hmm. So 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 why not go all the way? Why not? Thank you. Let's give the attorney for the Afro descendant nations, Harriet Abu Bakr, a strong round of applause. Give it to her, please. Here at the National Press Club on behalf of the Afro descendant nation. All right, we're getting ready now. Okay, just so formally, my name is Brother Attorney Malik Shabazz. I'm here representing as the National President of Black Lawyers for Justice, that great legal organization that is fighting police brutality on behalf of our people all over the country. Please do not open that door again. Now, one more time. We got to act like it if we understand up in here. Sorry about that. Once again, brother, can you stand on the outside of that door and don't let nobody in that door, please? Thank you so much. Bear with us. We rocking through this. Again, my name is Brother Attorney Malik Shabazz. I'm the National President of Black Lawyers for Justice, that great legal organization that is fighting police brutality across this country, especially in the state of Mississippi. I want to thank Dr. Cornell West because he took the time out of his schedule and he came to Mississippi to support our struggle against the Goon Squad and Sheriff Brian Bailey. And because in part of Dr. Cornell West's help coming to help us with the goon squad, that group of white racist police officers that tortured and abused my clients, Michael Jenkins and Eddie Parker, because in part for Dr. West's sacrifice and help, those officers received a total of 132 years in prison. Federal prison time, 132 years which represent the longest sentences for police brutality ever in America, right. particularly when the victims are not even dead. Right. And it occurred in the state of Mississippi where they said no justice would come. But because of our fight, our tenacity, and our conviction for justice, we made justice happen where persons had thought that justice could not happen. Right. So I want to thank Dr. West for coming to Mississippi and supporting us and supporting the Emmett Till family and the Emmett Till cause. We hear now, uh, uh, I want to hear his opinions. We want, we've seen the student uprising around the country. We've seen students of all races boldly standing up across this nation. And, uh, 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 and we saw them also uh, in, in encampments and we saw them standing up for what is right. And we also saw the backlash and the crackdown, and we saw them attacked by police in this country. We want to know what Dr. West's position is on the student uprising. We just, we want to know what his position is on United States foreign policy. We just saw President Joe Biden give another billion dollars of weapons to the state of Israel, right when the Israeli army is menacing Rafa. And and he allegedly is giving them warnings. Don't go into Rafa. And then we see him turn her right around and give him a billion dollars worth of weapons to go and bomb Rafa. And we want to know what our candidate says about about the about these thirty five thousand uh, lives that have been murdered and assassinated and bombed in Gaza. We wanna know his position on that and the world wants to know his position. The world wants to know, is there a candidate coming forth in America that has any sense at all 
huh? any sense at all, any morality at all, any respect for human rights for the peoples and the nations of the earth. America wants to know this and the people want to know this, but I already know it. I don't have no problem telling you straight out from black lawyers for justice and many lawyers in America and those who are in the police brutality and the reparation struggle that we endorse Dr. Cornell West as a president of the United States of America. He's the only one that we could ever dream of straightening this madness out. And his vice president, uh, Sister Melina Abdullah. This is the voice of consciousness in America on the political scene in this hour. We want and must have full and complete reparations. I represent also the Afro descendant nation as an attorney and conductor in this reparations movement. We have and launched a national reparations boycott and sanctions campaign against the banks and the companies that have robbed us. We, have, we are opening and announcing our national sanctions campaign. And what is, our, what is that? Sanctions, can you say that? Sanctions. What is that? Sanctions. Huh? Sanctions. Say it louder. Sanctions. Let me hear it again. Sanctions. Let me hear it again. Sanctions. It was the Montgomery bus boycott in the 1950s by Sister Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King while people said that we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. So they pulled out of the Montgomery bus system and they began to form black transportation companies, black cab companies, and they dried up the Montgomery bus uh, system there in Alabama. And that sparked what is called the civil rights movement or the struggle in the 1950s that led us into the 1960s. But it was from the power of the black dollar. What we're saying you here today that the reparations movement is taking up to another level. We are no longer talking about it. We're no longer uh, saying what we will do about it. We are taking actions and we're taking action against companies that are proven to have their roots and their ties into slavery. We're talking about Wells Fargo. Is that who? Who is that? The reparations movement is formally asking all of our people and all of the people in America who have a conscience to pull your money out of Wells Fargo Bank and to do it now as you hear the sound of my voice and you're watching this broadcast, the reparations movement is demanding that we withdraw out of Wells Fargo. We're demanding that we withdraw out of Barclays Bank. We're demanding that we withdraw out of Catholic, I mean, pardon me, Capital One Bank, who is tied to the Catholic Church, who our research has shown that the papal bulls and papal decrees sentenced our people to the transatlantic slave trade, sentenced our people to death. Many years ago, we have been robbed by the Catholic Church, robbed by the popes, and there are still banks that are doing business with that church today, and one of them is Capital One Bank in Washington, DC. What bank is that? What bank is that? Yes, yes, we're saying pull your money and your funds out of Capital One Bank. Aetna, New York Life, what Dr. West has called the super capitalists, the oligarchs, those who really control the money. We don't have a candidate in office that is willing to face the super capitalists and the oligarchs and those that run this nation, but the candidate that is sitting right here, the only candidate in the race who has a spine and a backbone, we don't have one other than that, other than the man that's sitting here right now. All of, So we want you to support the National Sanctions Campaign. We want you to go to reparationsboycott.org if you're listening, reparationsboycott.org because uh, we must shut them down. Yes. We must what? Shut them. We must what? Shut them. We are not gonna finance those that have exploited and robbed us and sit here as if we have no willpower. Right. We are not gonna sit here and constantly back any political party that treats us like, uh, uh, pardon my language, uh, prostitutes mm -hmm. in the middle of the night. And they'll court us in the middle of the night. But in the daytime, when it's time for justice, when it's time for that George Floyd Policing Act, when it's time for reparation, they don't know us and don't even want to see us. We're sick and tired of being sick and tired.
Now, they say that Dr. West, they, they say that Dr. West uh, 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 is the wild card in the election, that, that he is the one that if he takes any vote in the so-called swing state, or any of the states that he could overturn and topple the election. Yep. Oh, well, I say is you're going to have to deal with Dr. West. <laughs> it's time for you to deal with Dr. West right now because we're back in Dr. West. And we want you now to hear from uh, who we want to be, who I want to be, the next president of the United States of America and the strongest voice of moral consciousness and for human rights in this election and a legend in our struggle. Let us receive presidential candidate Dr. Cornell West. <laughs> Come on, give it to me. Oh, what a blessing, what an honor, what a privilege. Oh, yes, no, indeed, indeed. I tell you, I wouldn't want to be in any other place than right here in the National Press Club. In Washington, D.C. used to be a chocolate city, but gentrification now is set in. But I want to begin. Hold on one sec. Sure. Everything all right? Yeah, all right, all right. No, no, indeed, indeed. Indeed, indeed. Come on, give him another round. Yeah, no, no, we're going to absolutely no. It, I want to begin by by saluting my dear brother. Oh, I'm telling you, uh, Malik Shabazz, I met almost 30 years ago, and he was on fire. He was at the State of the Black Union with Brother Tavis Smiley. You all remember those meetings we used to have? In fact, we have another one right before Juneteenth, starting all over again this summer. But when I met my dear brother Malik Shabazz, he was on fire. And after all of these years, the same fire is at work in his heart and his mind and his soul. And that fire has everything to do with what my campaign is about which is rooted in a deep love of the people. And when you love the people, you tell the truth. You're willing to serve. You're willing to sacrifice. You're willing to take a risk. You're willing to cut against the grain. And the historic victory that he and Brother Trent, was Brother Trent? Is that his name? Yes, sir. Well, I met down in Mississippi, the historic victory in the name of our precious brother, Michael Jenkins and Eddie Parker is not to be underestimated. Because Mississippi is ground zero for struggle for black people. That's why I started my campaign right there in the space of Fannie Lou Hamer's shadow in with the Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party and got the endorsement right away. And I knew I was on the right track. And then there is Brother Malik and Trent and the others, but led by Brother Malik. It's, and got a chance to meet members of the family. And then the victory. It is no small victory. It is an unprecedented historic victory to have some justice in Mississippi where so many magnificent New World Africans, magnificent black folk have straightened their backs up, but also the center of some of the most vicious white supremacist treatments imaginable. So let's give it up one more time to my dear brother Malik Shabazz. Major, major victory. Major, major victory. Of course, I want to thank all of the voices here, but I want to zero in on the Honorable Silas Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm telling you, 86 years young. My God, straight out of Texas. <laughs> Where my mama's from. Marlon, my mama's from Orange, my brother born in Port Arthur, so I have a bias toward Texas, no doubt. But then on to Los Angeles and then all around the world, the Middle East, Africa, there with the magnificent Esquire lawyer and attorney, Harriet, both of them a dynamic dual, dual based on what? Same thing, love for the people. And when you love folk, you protect them. You respect them, That's right. and you correct them. Mm. 
all three. And to be able to sit here with my dear brother is a blessing. It really is. Let's give it up for my dear brother, the Honorable Silas Muhammad. Lord, 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 Lord. He was telling me about driving Malcolm X around in Los Angeles. Is that right, my brother? Having those dialogues with Malcolm. Of course, yesterday was Malcolm's birthday. Just like Lorraine Hansberry, both of them born May the 19th. And so much of what we talk about today is what Malcolm called chickens coming home to roost. That the veil is being ripped off. Yes, sir. So you can see all the lies hiding the crimes, all the mendacity hiding the criminality. And we were told it was about liberty. Teach. Hypocrisy on steroids. Mm. <laughs> That's what we're dealing with today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this campaign, I'm so glad to see my dear sister, Trisha Dent. She's head of my justice for all party in D.C. Give it up for my dear sister. Just wave. People can see your beautiful smile. Can see her beautiful smile. That this campaign ain't nothing but a movement in a tradition of struggle of a great black people who for 400 years have been so chronically hated every day of their lives, but keep dishing out love warriors every generation. It's about love supreme, John Coltrane. It's about love and need love of Stevie Wonder. Those are not just songs, those are love warriors. One of the reasons why we're in the situation we're in today, we don't have enough black spokespersons and black leaders who really love the people. Yeah. They scared, they intimidated, they afraid, they laughing when it ain't funny and scratching when it don't itch. They too well adjusted to injustice and well adapted to indifference, and therefore you can't depend on them. They lukewarm. Yes, sir. That's right. And when you really mm -hmm. deeply have a commitment yeah. to a serious love of the people, and all of us are cracked vessels, so we're gonna make mistakes and judgments, but you have to be consistent over time. And that's what we don't have enough of. I come from a people who have been terrorized for 400 years. Yes, sir. 500, my dear sister. Right yes, sir. Says. Yet we produce freedom fighters. And yes, we call for freedom for all. We've always been an inclusive people, a global people, an international people. But we begin on the chocolate side of town. Hey. <laughs> you got too many leaders who love everybody but black people. <laughs> I begin by loving my mama, my daddy, my grandmama, my granddaddy, my, my aunt, my uncle. I come out of Glen Eldridge, the chocolate side of Sacramento. I come out of Shiloh Baptist Church, of Willie, Reverend Willie P. Cook from Brookhaven, Mississippi, who baptized me. I'm deeply influenced by the Black Panther Party of Huey Newton and oh, Erica Huggins and a whole host of others. How come? Even given the different ideologies and politics, they had a love of the people. Go ahead. Talk to us, Dr. West. Ah, oh, that's what we need. And the only thing that breaks the back of fear is love. Yes, sir. The only thing that gives people a sense of hope and feeling as if there is no hope is people who are willing to manifest the love. Never forget the story of Martin Luther King Jr. But I remember Daddy King told me, he said, Brother West, when I saw Martin, my son, I couldn't believe it was the lowest point in my life. He was in that paddy wagon for four and a half hours in the dark with a German shepherd from ATL, A-Town, Atlanta, driving all the way to Breedsville Prison. And when he got out, he couldn't walk a straight line. All he could say was, this is the cross we must bear for the freedom of our people. Go ahead. Talk to it. That's love. Talk to it. That's concrete. Talk to it. That's fleshify. Yes, sir. That's manifest. That's something that's real as a heart attack. Yes, sir. Come on, brother. Strong as stone and new as foam. That's what I'm talking about. Mm. And I'm nothing but just a little small wave in the river of these great black people's tradition of love warriors and freedom fighters. Mm. And we also joy shares, given all of our sorrow. So this came, this campaign is as much about Curtis Mayfield and Aretha Franklin as it is Martin Luther King Jr. and Fannie Lou Hamer. Mm. Mm. I'm a jazz man. I'm a blues man. 
I'm a rhythm and blues man. And when I'm down and out, if I can't put on some Lisa Vandross and put on just a little James Brown, and I ain't even got to James Cleveland yet. Warming up. We're talking about the tradition of a people. Yes, sir. Yes. And it's a tradition of a people in the midst of an American empire that is experiencing overwhelming spiritual decay and moral decadence. And that's not new. new. It has been wrestling with spiritual decay and moral decadence for indigenous peoples and black peoples and poor peoples mm. and working peoples mm. for hundreds of years. But now the chickens coming home to roost. Mm. Come on, come on. This is a unique historical moment. Yes, sir. A distinctive, unprecedented political, cultural, and spiritual moment. That's right. Come on. But one of the things we got to do always and already is get our souls intact. Mm. We're talking before, my brother Silas, about the spiritual grounds. If you're not ready spiritually to tell the truth, and see justice mm. with style mm. and a smile. Mm. Just like B.B. King playing Lucille saying, nobody loves me but my mama and she might be jiving too. <laughs> yes, we are blues people. Go ahead. Mary Baratha understands that. And what does it mean to be a blues people when you're in electoral politics? It means first... As Coltrane starts off Love Supreme, that first section is acknowledgement. You got to acknowledge the lies, yes, acknowledge the suffering, yes, acknowledge the misery, yes, acknowledge the overwhelming pain and hurt and scars and bruises of folk. Yes, if you sir. don't start there, you're already twisted. Mm. Mm. We haven't had the kind of spokesmanship and leadership on a collective level to tell the truth of the catastrophe. Mm. Mm. We got folk talking about problems. Mm. There ain't never been no Negro problem in America. Teach. There's been catastrophes visited upon black people mm. and African people. Mm. And once you reduce the catastrophic to the problematic, you've already deodorized the situation. Mm. And we are funk people. Mm. I don't spend time with Bootsy for nothing. Mm. I don't love George Clinton for nothing. Mm. I don't listen to Sun Raw for nothing. Mm. They say we're going to keep it real and raw and funky. We don't want sanitized, sterilized, deodorized discourses. We got to tell the truth, and the truth is always beneath the deodorized level. Mm. Most of these politicians, no matter what color they are, they're just deodorized. Yeah. Right. That's right. Just little puppets, nothing but just echoes of a silo. Thank God that the Johnson people, when they came up with the anthem for black people, came up with lift every voice, not lift every echo. Mm. Right. And if you're all you're going to be is just an echo of a silo, then tell the people the truth and say you're just concerned about your career. You've given up on your calling. You've given up on telling the truth. You've given up on the funk. And don't fake, don't fake the funk. Mm. <laughs> and you say, well, Brother West, what's this got to do with a campaign announcement? I'm just setting the stage. <laughs> We got to understand what the context is. Warm us up, Doc. Warm us up. Because I'm coming into electoral politics as somebody whose major qualification is somebody who's been running for justice for 50 years. Mm. Somebody who's been trying to tell the truth for 50 years. That's somebody right. seeking justice for 50 years. That's right. And I've also been running for Jesus. Mm. Mm. I want to be honest of where I'm coming from. Yes, mm. I love my Muslim brothers and sisters. I don't exist without Malcolm X. Mm. I don't exist without Muhammad Ali. Mm. This brother here, Honorable Silas Muhammad, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, a whole host of others, whatever disagreements I have, my love for them is deeper. Oh, praise the Duke. Praise oh, God. Way to break that praise down. I'm, I'm, I'm honest about that. 
but I'm a Jesus loving free black man. We are too. And that's what gives me my strength. So I don't have to worry about somehow thinking that I don't have the fortitude. I don't have a thick enough armor in order to meet this battle in order to work through all of these lies and crimes and to make sure these folk not going to try to render me so afraid and scared that somehow I give up or cave in or sell out. No. Mm. No, no, no. I'll be a dead man. I'd rather be a corpse than a cow wife. True. Brother Martin used to say, I'd rather be dead than afraid. That's what we need when the moment of the chickens coming home to roost. So when you look at America, the first thing you see is it's an empire, not just a nation. Mm. There's been 70 empires since the beginnings of the species coming out of Africa. America's number 68. Every empire comes and goes. Mm. Every empire has a history. It emerges, sustained, begins to go down, and usually it's military overreach. Usually it's the corruption of their elites and their politicians. Usually it's the lies coming back and constituting a kind of blowback for them, given all the consequences of the lies that they've been told. Usually it has something to do with everyday people, the citizens feeling as if they're so hopeless and helpless and impotent and frustrated that they're willing to follow a strong man in the form of a tyrant. Mm. Wake us up. That's where we are. Trump ain't nothing but a bona fide gangster. <laughs> Wanna be. Not even the real thing. Because I grew up with some dead up gangsters. And I still got a lot of gangster in me, so I know one when I see it. But he's tied to big military, he's tied to big money, so you can't even see what's behind him. And he manipulates the white supremacists and the male supremacists and all the other various forms of hatred and fear that he, that, that, that he engages in and indulges in so that people can't see exactly what he represents. He acts as if somehow he's with the common folk, but he's a billionaire, at least he says he is. Mm. And then Biden, acting as if he's some kind of progressive. Come on. Come on. Oh, that upset me in Morehouse yesterday. To see the great Morehouse College embrace a war criminal, to embrace a genocide enabler, as if he's a grand exemplar of peace and justice. I want to tell the Morehouse brothers and sisters, we were born at night, but not last night. <laughs> to violate flagrantly Precious legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. You've trot him out as the grand example of Morehouse, and he turns over in his grave because he died talking about what? Poverty. He died talking about what? White supremacy. He died talking about what? Materialism. He died talking about what? Militarism. Those, right. That's how you measure any nation or empire. How you're treating poor folk. Look at the prisons. Look at the hoods. Look at the barrios and see how the people are doing. Jeez. Then you look in the souls of the children and see what they focus on. What's their major attention? Is it the deodorized sup superficial things of status and spectacle and image or is it trying to wrestle with integrity, honesty, decency, being part of a community and willingness to take a risk for that community? Mm -hmm. That's Martin King. Wake us up. People say, oh, Brother West, you're always so hard on black folk. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. Not at all. I'm critical of anybody, but I'm especially critical of black folk because I try to love them so. I'm concerned about them. I'm concerned about the future. I'm concerned about the young folk not having access to the best of our history. What went into the making of a Harriet Tubman? What went into the making of a Marcus Garvey? What went into the making of an Ella Baker? Mm. or Tony Morrison. Mm. That's the challenge. Mm. And the only way young folk will be able to make a connection is be able to, to see it clearly. We living in a moment now, if folk can't see the sermon, they don't want to hear a sermon. Mm. 
If you don't exemplify it in what you're doing, Jeez. what you're willing to serve and sacrifice, then all the language in the world is sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. It's empty. It's vacuous. Yes. Now that this campaign is beginning to intensify and you got the choice between the bona fide gangster and the genocide enabler, where do people go? It reminds me of the words of the great Henry Highland Garnett in 1837 was the first time that black people were able to come together. These are free Negroes in Philadelphia, 1837. He had one leg. He's leaning on a crutch, probably with a little gangster lean. <laughs> Henry Highland Garnett in Liberia, making the connections that you all made. Mm. What did he say to black people? He said, black folk never confuse our situation with that of the Israelites of the Old Testament of Hebrew scripture. For us, Pharaoh is on both sides of the bloody Red Sea. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh on both sides. What you going to do? I could hear a beautiful black sister in the back, and it's usually the black women who stand up first. Let's just be honest, brothers. We like to be out there and acting like we so big and bad, but we know that we not too much without our sisters. And one of them said, could somebody just sing a song, please? A crack a joke. Or somebody to touch somebody. Or somebody grin. You see, that's loving folk too. We got to learn how to enable and empower folk in a variety of different ways. Justice is what love looks like in public. Tenderness is what love feels like in private. The black people have been a tender people. And try a little tenderness, says the genius from Macon, George, the name of Otis Redden. Even Roni is a tender Roni for Bobby Brown. <laughs> written by baby face. That's not just a song. Tender. We got to be tough but tender with each other. Even when we disagree. Honest with each other when we disagree. The love is deeper. Mm -hmm. The tenderness. The kindness. What did James Baldwin say about Malcolm X? Never met a more gentle human being in my life. Look at that perception as opposed to the white mainstream perception of Malcolm. Man full of rage, indignation. Yes, he's hating white supremacy. He's hating injustice. Yes, he's sir. hating domination. He's hating subjugation. But he was a gentle man. Mm -hmm. yes, he was. And one of the signs of decadence in Black America is that we used to be a much more soulful people. Yes, sir. And soul ain't nothing but the sharing of a soothing sweetness against the backdrop of grim catastrophe. Mm. How do we soothe each other with a sweetness when we all down and out and sometimes think that Pharaoh's on both sides of the bloody red seas and somebody raises their voice and say, I think we can make a way out of no way. I think maybe we can step out on nothing and land on something. Mm. I think that what seems to be so impossible can still be in our reach if we could create some forms of community and family and solidarity such that we surprise ourselves and in connection with a God that is in larger control, lo and behold, we surprise the world. Mm. That's the history of black people at our best. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That's what this campaign is about. Mm -hmm. See, so when I think of foreign policy, yes, sir. I say America is an empire. I want to head the empire to dismantle the empire. Go ahead. I am an anti-imperialist. What does it mean to dismantle the empire when 62 cents, my dear, dear, magnificent? Vice presidential candidate and assistant comrade, fellow intellectual Dr. Melina Abdullah put it so well, the 62 cent that goes to the military for every dollar 
So when it comes to war, we can find trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars when it comes to health care, when it comes to schools, when it comes to safe neighborhoods, when it comes to education, we can't find a penny. That's warped priorities. Yes, sir. It shows that we living in an empire where 1% of the population own 90% of the wealth. Three individuals have wealth equivalent to 50% of the citizens in the country. 160 million people have wealth equivalent to three people. Mm. That's spiritually sick. Yes, sir. Grotesque wealth inequality. Jeez. And we come from a tradition of abolitionists. We want to abolish slavery. We don't want a liberal version of it. Mm. We want to abolish Jim and Jane Crow. We don't want a neoliberal version of it. Talk to us. This campaign wants to abolish poverty. It wants to abolish homelessness. Mm. Nobody ought to be poor in the richest nation in the history of the world. Most of the money is going to the military. We got to massively disinvest 800 military units around the world, 130 special operations in 130 nations. And all we have to do is look. Lay it out. The Congo, look at Haiti. We're going to get to Gaza. Mm. But it's not just there. Mm. It's all around the world. They call it full spectrum dominance. Mm. Broader than Rome, more extensive than the British Empire. Yes, That's sir. what the American Empire brags on, even as it is imploding this very moment. They call it polarization, and I call it gangsterization. Mm. It's not just polarization. Mm. It's the gangsterization of the country. More and more people don't trust anybody. More and more people willing to grab for their gun in any moment of conflict. That has much to do with the gun violence, not just in the country as a whole, but within the black community. Because if you believe you can militarize the world, then that comes home and you end up militarizing your own society. I have trouble, traveled all across the nation. I go to elementary schools. They got more police than they have nurses and counselors. That's a militarized school. Talk to us. You teaching young folk. Talk to us. You have conflict, go to Miller. Oh, yes. That's what the nation does in the world. That's what it is at home. Mm. That's spiritual decay. That's moral decadence. And what's behind the foreign policy? Big money. War manufacturers. Big, big money. Oligarchs. Plutocrats. Multi-millionaires, multi-billionaires behind the scene, gaining access to more and more monies. Do we know, does America know there's $8.7 trillion around the world in tax offshore for tax evasion? And yet we got poor folk who don't have access to health care, don't have access to jobs with a living wage. We got young folk with student debt, even as they graduate. How long can any society sustain itself? What does that have to do with reparations? Everything to do with reparations. Because before you get to reparations, you have to have a lens through which you view the world in which truth and justice are at the center. And the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. You'll never know the truth about America's past or present unless you listen to the voices of those who suffer. And therefore, if you want to understand America from the vantage point of those who suffer, you begin with those who have been bombarded with white supremacy. Now, I know as black folk, we want to move directly to Africa, but we will never, ever deny the suffering of our indigenous brothers and sisters. That's right. They don't have to be in the room for us to tell the truth about their suffering because we're concerned about truth across the board. That's right. Absolutely. That's genocide. There's no accident that America cannot uh, acknowledge genocide in Gaza. It can't even acknowledge genocide in its own history. Man, talk to us. And then you come back to the enslavement of, of African peoples, dignified African peoples, and denial. James Baldwin used to say the innocence itself is the crime. 
how you going to be innocent when you're the authorizers of the devastation? Jeez. Come on, Can Mr. You imagine how spiritually sick that is. That's been the history of the country for too long. And on the black side of town, the only way you can keep black people under control is to niggerize us. Come on, come on. Talk to us, man. To get us to believe we're really less beautiful. We're really less intelligent. We're really less moral. We ought to be running around scared all the time, distrusting one another, thinking we can't come together to constitute some solidarity and unity and diversity, and therefore the white supremacy inside of black people makes it difficult for us to straighten our backs up. It's one of the things we learned from the Honorable, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. <laughs> Straighten your back up. Yes, sir. Out on the front of the newspaper. Islam dignifies. Teach. Right. Teach us, Dr. West. Islam dignifies. Come on, Mr. President. I got it from Jesus. Even you could be secular, get it your own way. But that was a deep insight of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And it still is. We see it among our young folk these days. Where is the courage? Where is the vision? So reparations is simply an effort to tell the truth about the history of America. Was there damage done? Was there theft that took place? Absolutely. If that's true, then what is the nature of the repair? What is the nature of the reparations? Either you have a commitment to justice or you don't. There's nothing tribal about that. There's nothing concerned about one small group. Any group that's been treated in that way deserves reparation. Right. Then why is it that when black folk make the demand, somehow it is off the chart, somehow it's not on the table, partly because right. we haven't been strong enough and unified enough to make the demand strong. Right. Right. I recall when William O. Patterson and Paul Robeson and W.B. Du Bois went to the United Nations in 19. 1951 and said what? We charge genocide. Teach. We charge genocide. Very much like our two dynamic duo, mm. duo traveling the world. Brother Niles, you know what I'm talking about with this yes, beloved dog. You know what I'm talking about, my brother. Straight out of Arkansas. <laughs> and you go to world court and you say what? We make a demand of justice. That's what reparations is, is a demand of justice. And one of the fundamental commitments of this campaign is to have justice across the board. Now, I believe that as citizens, no matter what color you are, you ought to have access to free education, free Medicare. You ought to have access to a job with a living wage, and no one ought to fall below a certain basic income. But reparations for black people right. is in addition to that, because our plight and predicament has been that of sub-citizens, non-citizens, based on other folk arriving immediately and becoming citizens from Europe. That's the history that needs to be told. That's the kind of vision that this campaign is fundamentally all about. Now, I know I've gone on long, and you all have been very, very patient in this regard. But let me end on this note, that even though this is an unprecedented moment, you got a whole lot of people out there that are deeply confused. They don't know where to turn. They don't see any clarity. And it's partly because people so often are speaking out of so many different sides of their mouths. Because, see, when you're an echo of a silo, you can say one thing on Monday, something else on Wednesday, forgot what you said on Friday, and act as if you're consistent. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I give you a good example of that in regard to Biden. 
Biden said the other night in Detroit, and he's sitting in front of all these beautiful black folk in Motown. And he says, uh, what would Trump say if January 6th here in the Capitol, instead of the deeply right wing folk who marched in and violated the place, if it were black people, you say, yeah, black folk raised that question as soon as it took place. Because <laughs> everybody knows what would happen. You would have shot us down like we but... mm, smithereens, like dogs. You would have tried to crush us like we cockroaches. Mm -hmm. Talk to we understand that. But then I say to Mr. Biden, what would you say if... 15,000 white children had been killed and murdered Jeez. by Palestinians, by Arabs, by Africans, by people of color, by black people. What would have been your response? Do you think your response would have been to hold back for seven months until the election begins to cut? No way. White supremacy operating in Gaza, operating in U.S. foreign policy right there in the Middle East, right there on the West Bank. Mm -hmm. right. So let's be consistent. There's no way that you would provide billions and billions of dollars of new military equipment killing those children and women and men who you know are innocent and still allow it if somehow those were white children. Okay. Let's be morally constant. Yes, sir. Wake us up. So what indeed ought to be done? Well, the first thing needs to be done. We got to point out the lies and tell the story about how Israel became a state. <laughs> the gift of the British Empire in 1917 with the Balmer Declaration. How did it become a state? 1948 with the United Nations. How is the United Nations going to create a state? Come on, Mr. Mm. President. Especially when other folk are already there. Talk to us, man. Talk to us, man. Reminds me of the European settlers when they arrived in the New World and said there's no human beings here. It's just buffaloes and Indians. Hey. Oh, well, we come from a great black tradition that says Indians are human just like everybody else. Go ahead. We don't know about the buffaloes, but we know these indigenous brothers and sisters have exactly the same value as any human being in the world. Sir. Yes, sir. Promoting your white supremacist lies in order to justify your power grab and your land grab and your attempt to dominate the continent and call it manifest destiny when it ain't nothing but organized greed and institutional hatred. We got to tell the truth. Come on, man. Come on. Tell the truth about Gaza. A vicious Israeli occupation. Mm. Bishop Tutu called it apartheid worse than South Africa. Mm. I knew Bishop Tutu. I love that brother. He's a pacifist like Martin King. I'm not a pacifist. I'm just a, a Christian. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> On a good day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me now. <laughs> But you know what apartheid means? It means the terrorism is institutionalized every day, just like it's been for black people. Mm. That's why our young black folk are rising up in the colleges all around the country and other folk of all different colors, because they know that when the TV talks about terror, they only mean a particular form of it from a particular group. But we know the terrorism and takes a whole host of different forms. Talk to us, Mr. President. You see, when you have an American army that kills innocent people, half a million Iraqis, and won't say a mumbling word, that is American terrorism. Talk to us. When the IDF is killing innocent Palestinians, that is Israeli terrorism. Talk to us, Mr. President. Now, I'm against terrorism. I don't believe in killing any innocent folk, no matter. I have strong discussions with my left-wing comrades and so forth.
Oh, Brother West, you don't need to be criticizing X or Y. I said, no, no, I'm a free black man, so I'm going to tell the truth. I'm against killing any innocent folk. I don't care who it is. But I'm also quite aware of the way in which folk don't want to talk about the terrorism from above, among the powerful. They only want to talk about counter-terrorist response to the terrorism and call that terrorism. One of the great questions in the history of black people is why it is that we never formed the black version of the Ku Klux Klan. We had deacons for defense, Black Panther Party for self-defense. We had the black power movement in all of its magnificent ways. And of course, Brother Stokely, Brother Kwame Toure, I was blessed to know him, travel the country with him. It's hard to find somebody who loved black people more than Stokely Carmichael. Mm. And he's my Trinidadian brother coming in from New York. So he's loving those used to be called Negroes. Oh, oh that's, that's, that's powerful. Thanks so much. That's powerful. Cause we got a lot of tensions these days with Caribbean black folk and black folk from Mississippi and, 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 and Arkansas and other places. <laughs> We've got to acknowledge our differences and, and, and accent our commonality. And that's wrong from being from Barbados, nothing wrong from being Antigua and so forth. But coming from Mississippi, yeah, you're going to have a different kind of formation, but you're still subject to the same white supremacist abuse, same white supremacist attack, same white supremacist assault. And we had to be able to work together in light of our different cultural and spiritual formations. That's all right. Same is true with our magnificent folk from Africa. And in the end, we're looking for solidarity with oppressed people around the world, no matter what color. Yes, sir. What this campaign is about is first and foremost, a moment of the global awakening of the chickens coming home to roost for the American empire that's been so tied to organized greed, institutionalized hatred, and routinized indifference to those who are vulnerable, mm. poor and working people. Mm. Wake us up. So it up. ends up an indictment of a whole lot of black leadership. And I want to be very clear about this. It's not out of hatred, but it's out of love, but it's a love for the people. Yes, sir. See, my brother Al Sharpton gave that funeral the eulogy for brother Tyree in, uh, in Memphis. And I love Brother Sharp, and I go back 40 years. I've known him. We worked together. I was there when he got out of jail with his blessed wife, Kathleen. But when he said, I want to tell the world about what Martin Luther King Jr. saw when he went up on the mountaintop. We said, Brother Sharp, and what did he see? What did he see, brother? Tell us. He said he saw Barack Obama and Kamala Harris. I said, that ain't what he saw, brother. That ain't what he saw. What did he see? I don't know what he saw, but he didn't see that. Talk to it. That's a sign of a black leadership who views the litmus test of black freedom with just black faces in high places rather than precious Jamal and Letitia on the block wrestling with education that's misguided, mass incarceration, underemployment, unemployment, wrestling with whether they respect themselves enough, love themselves enough, whether they think they can come together and be a forth for good. Yes, sir. For too long in the last 50 years, we've looked up to see what the litmus test of black progress is, to see what the black middle class looks like. And I'm just here to say that I'm from a tradition from the 25th chapter of Matthew that says, what you do for the least of these, you do unto me. Talk to it. Oh, I want to know what the prisoners are. I was blessed to teach in prisons for 51 years, starting in Norfolk, where Malcolm was when I was undergrad in college. I want to know what the least of these are in terms of the folk who oftentimes just drift in, don't have rich relations with their fathers, wrestling with their mothers, still unable to sustain deep friendships with their friends. See, that's part of the war against black people and the war against young black people. 
to ensure they don't cultivate the capacity enough to both love themselves and be able to open themselves to be intimate and vulnerable enough, not just in personal relationships, but in collective relationships. And without that trust, you'll never have a movement. You'll never have any kind of social effort that is collective because we'll never trust each other. Mm -hmm. That's deep. Mm -hmm. That's a spiritual and a political and a social and an economic one. Mm. We can't even have a strong entrepreneurial class if we don't have black folk who trust each other enough to create institutions to sustain it over time and place. Us, man. We can't even sustain our churches any longer when you have these preachers coming in acting like they CEOs rather than pastors. Mm. And changing the blood at the bottom of the cross into nothing but thin Kool-Aid. Mm. that'll never sustain you in the face of catastrophe. Mm. Oh, that's a spiritual decay. Wake us up. Oh, it brings tears to your eyes of grandmama and granddaddy who sacrificed so much and blood, sweat, and tears poured into us so much love, integrity, honesty, trying to tell us, treat somebody right, help somebody before you die. Yes, sir. Oh, what a people. Yes, sir. yes, we are great people. We got to go back and recover. Ain't got nothing to do with the greatness that Trump talks about. He's talking about Alexander the Great. He's talking about Napoleon. He's talking about about Genghis Khan. He's talking about Attila. We talking about Fannie Lou Hamer. Peach. We talking about Martin King. We talking about Malcolm. Peach. Peach. I'm talking about a Palestinian Jewish swarthy complexion named Jesus. Yes, we can move to Muhammad too. We can move to prophetic Jewish brothers and sisters too of a Amos and Esther. Mm. But we're talking about moral and spiritual greatness. This campaign and talking about U.S. foreign policy, talking about Gaza, talking about the students hungry and thirsty for what Ashford and Simpson called the real thing. Mm -hmm. Not that superficial stuff. Yes, Not sir. just success, but greatness. Not just material things, but a strong character that allows you to gain access to material things, but those material things don't become the only thing you're concerned about. That's idolatry. That's in part what this campaign is all about. So you can see it's not an ordinary campaign at all. Yes, sir. <laughs> Come on now. Not at all. Come on now. Not at all. And only because I don't come from an ordinary tradition. I don't come from an ordinary people. I come from a great tradition of great people willing to tell the truth, seek justice, and in the end, pay whatever cost it is. Because as my dear sister, Dr. Abdullah said, it's in part a debt. But I know I have a debt to my mother and father and granddaddy and grandmama. I can never, ever repay. Never. And I will always fall short. I'll never be the human being that they were. But at least part of their afterlife is at work in my life. And part of the afterlife of the ancestors of great love warriors and freedom fighters and unbelievable joy spreaders ought to be part of our lives. Mm. So the re reparations, yes, it's at the center in relation to all of these other issues. And then we shall see what they have to say about what we are and what we do. Thank you all so very much. Come on now, let's give it up for Dr. Cornell West. Give him a strong round of applause, sisters and brothers. Give it up for him again. Oh. Our presidential candidate, the only candidate that will ever speak this kind of truth to power to the American people, to our people. All right, we're going to get right into the questions. Have a seat. We got a rare moment here. And this is a classic. This has been a quintessential and classic campaign speech on behalf of Dr. West, where he's laid out the campaign strategy, ideology, and philosophy, and what we're here for. If you have a question, 
for Dr. West from here, from any of the speakers or anyone in the audience. Go ahead now, raise your hand and I'll call on you. Right there, sir, state your name and then I'll come to you, ma'am. Sam P. A. Carlin from the Washington Informal Newspaper. Uh, my question for you, Dr. West, thank you for being here. What's your voter mobilization strategy? Um, what you've been talking about resonates with a population that doesn't go to the ballot box out of this decade yeah. when you had a yeah. government. So what's your strategy as far as uh, engaging them and encouraging them to come out to the ballot box or not? Yeah, I appreciate that. Oh, oh, I, I guess that. Let's give it up for the young brother here, though. We're looking at the future. Looking at the future, this brother here. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Appreciate the question, though. I mean, part of our challenge has been, of course, is that the corporate duopoly, which is dictated by big money, tries to make it difficult for any independent candidate to emerge. And so we had start from zero. It's interesting that the first state that came out and supported us was Alaska. I said, wow, that's... That's like the National Hockey League, doing. I said, good God, they got, it was Aurora Party. It has a uh, universal income that's basic, available to everybody. And they agree with our abolition program in terms of poverty. And that's just building on Martin King's. Then we got Oregon. We went on and on. So Trisha knows what I'm talking about. Now we're up to almost eight or nine. What happens is most of the states don't open themselves for signatures or money you have to pay until at the very end of May, beginning of June. I'm gonna be in Harlem at Marcus Garvey Park tomorrow because New York opens tomorrow. They got six weeks, 49,000 signatures. Usually you need about twice as many. So that's 98,000 right there mm. because every one out of two they say is invalid. Who makes a decision? The Democratic Republican Party officials. So you see how they see how they work to try to perpetuate themselves, make it more and more difficult. But we plan to be on, we hope, nearly all of the states by September, because by the time the conventions of the Republican and Democratic parties come along, that we're going to be on the vast majority of states. And then it really becomes intense. Mm. Just, and they know we're on the move. And we got more than RFKJR, but they don't really talk about it too much. And I didn't say too much about RFKJR. When I heard him say that the Palestinians are the most pampered people, I said, this brother, he got need to get off the crack pipe. I don't know what kind of world he's living in. Your name might be Kennedy, but I'm telling you, you just can't say anything. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Well, that's just the beginning. But I didn't say too much about him, but I've talked mainly about the main two. But it's going to be a, uh, a fascinating uh, moment when people begin to see the degree to which we do have ballot access. We've got volunteers mobilized all around the country. And I keep pointing out my dear sister, Tricia, she's here at the Justice for All Party, which is our party that gains access to the ballot right in D.C. Is that right? Absolutely. And we, we, we're going we're gonna to try to win D.C. Oh, yes. We're going to try to win D.C. That's All right. right. That's right. Let alone the other places. That's right. But you send aside from D.C., people say, oh, Lord, wait a minute. And D.C. is always on the cutting edge because it's just so many chocolate folk who've already woken up. That's one reason why you got taxation without representation. Okay. You see, I've been for a statehood for a long time. Long, 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 long time. Just like with reparations with Queen Mother Moore and Brother Randall Robertson, he just passed. He was my very dear brother. You all, you all know him as a founder for Trans Africa. I was on that on his committee for over 25 years working with, with Charles Ogletree when we had we called we fought for reparations in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we fought for reparations, took him to court. We lost that case, but it was a strong, strong case. But it's part of that same rich tradition of Queen Mother War, Randall Robinson, Cobra, all the way through the various organizations that are still working now. And uh, as I said, you know, in a moment like ours, we have to be very open to the unpredictable. Things are happening so fast. For all we know, Trump may be on his way to jail. <laughs> For all we know, Biden might do an LBJ move and decide, I can't make it. My polls look bad. 
And once the money no longer comes in, then they both have to go to their B team. Now, I'm still going. I'm constant. I'm consistent. I'm going to tell my truth. It's going to go all the way through. Go ahead. How come? Because it's just not about politics. It's about the spirit. It's about morality. It's about what is the right thing. That's right. It's about putting a smile on your grandmama's face from the grave. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Come on, let's give this candidate a hand in this historic forum at the National Press Club. The footage, the footage and the statements from this historic news conference is going out and will continue to go out and they will take the quotes and the teachings of Dr. Cornell West from this event will be spread far and wide. You better believe it. And so, uh, so I have a question, sir. Uh, yes. And then I want Miss Attorney Everson to ask the next question, but I, I'm going to ask the first question because I hear it all the time and we want to hear it right now. Uh, uh, candidate West, uh, in you attracting black voters and speaking to these black issues, aren't you taking votes away from the Democratic Party and helping Donald Trump? Yeah, no, I appreciate that, our brother. First thing I say is do not disrespect black people. That's right. That's a spiritual and moral issue even before you get to the politics. Because if you allow a disrespect to black folk, you're already giving in to Machiavellian calculations. By Machiavellian calculations, I mean you only concern with black folk when they vote rather than when they, in all of their humanity, have to live their lives week to week and month to month. Second thing is black people think critically like anybody else. So when you make your case and black folks say, I'm not convinced, that means they're not convinced. <laughs> that means you don't own their vote. Mm. It means that they not on automatic, all they got to do, all you got to do is push a button, they come running. Mm. No, we human beings who think through how we go about our lives and who we going to vote for, and if we vote for you, we reach that conclusion on our own. Right. You got to earn. That's it, my brother. Earn the black vote. And earn the black vote means what? Respect black people enough to acknowledge we think for ourselves. That's right. That's right. See, I'm the kind of hang loose black Baptist brother who spends a lot of time in nightclubs. <laughs> oh, I love it. Jazz clubs too. And I'm in the club and they say, Brother West, brother, we respect you, man. You've been out there for 50 years, but I don't know if I can vote for you. I said, let's sit down and talk about it. Let me hear what your argument is. Let me hear what your insight is. Here's my insight. We sit down and talk. We respect each other. And even if they end up disagreeing, and I think they're wrong, at least we've had an exchange. We acknowledge our respect. I don't go in thinking, I own black people's votes just because I'm a black man mm -hmm. because I never ever love black people in order for black people to love me back mm -hmm. love black people because they're worthy of being loved that's right, that's right. That's, that's at a spiritual level that's at a moral level so people who disagree with me, I don't go think they the devil or demonic or nothing. I just think they wrong. <laughs> and I engage them. You, you see, you know what I mean? Sir, yes, sir. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when you have a white supremacist mentality that think that black folk have always been your puppets, Teach. They don't think for themselves. You think for them, and when they reach a conclusion that's different than you, then somehow something wrong with them. No, something's wrong with you. Yeah. You haven't put a strong enough case. If Biden got a strong case for black people, let's hear what the case is. Yeah. Right. If black people are upset because you're enabling genocide, then quit enabling genocide. Jeez. If black people are upset because you couldn't push through the George 
Floyd Jr. bill because you didn't want to touch Manchin, you didn't want to touch the filibuster, you yeah. couldn't follow through on the John Lewis bill, all that talk about how much you love John Lewis, love John Lewis, love John Lewis, and when it's time for the bill, you couldn't even fight for it. <laughs> Please, yeah. earn the vote. Yes, sir. That's the, that's the important thing. No, I know it's getting late. No, 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 it ain't getting late. No, we, I'm gonna stay as long. No, we just gonna get all the questions. Tell me if I'm going on too long. No, you ain't, you, brother. <laughs> let me tell you this. <laughs> there ain't no time limits on on the truth. Trust me. We've been waiting for this. Is that right? Take your water. Coming to the next question. You are here at the net. We're coming to you. you um, just I'll come to you after here. You're at the National Press Club. We are at the National Forum on the fourth day of the National Reparations Convention as sponsored by the Afro-Descendant Nation, which is founded by the Honorable Silas Mohammed. That's where we're at. That's where we're at. No. Partly, partly by myself, but with the UN assistance and 19 uh, black nations throughout the diaspora. Mr. Mr. Honorable Silas Muhammad has, say, has pointed out the fact that 19 other nations in the Western Hemisphere, black people um, from 19 other nations in the Western Hemisphere make up the Afro-descendant nation. And he in America has established this program of reparations, is spearheading the program of reparations and self-determination on behalf of Afro-descendants in the Western Hemisphere, but those that are here in America. And he comes with the authority of 19 nations and then some, okay? Okay, now I want to say something that I want Attorney Everson to ask a question, and brother, I'll come to you and others, and I'm going to come back to my elder right now. Uh, I, I, I'd like to thank Malik Zerush Bar for listening and introducing me to my brother. <laughs> yeah, I thank you. All right, thank you. They told, you know what, the staff of Sheila and Jackson Lee, you know what they told us what? about President Biden? They said that when we're talking about the Federal Elections Commission, we uh, that President Biden could go beyond just the H.R. 40. You know, H.R. 40, we've been fighting for years just to get that vote in Congress. Mm -hmm. Well, they're saying now, well, President Biden, you could just create an executive order That's now okay. for the study of slavery, okay? And so that is that is what President Biden is supposed to be doing now. Well, in Sheila Jackson Lee's office, they said, well, you know, he, you can't pressure him. You said, hey, this is what they told us. You can't, you can't pressure him. Because if you pressure him, you won't get what you want. And we don't know, we don't believe in pressuring him. Is that what they said? They said that we can't even pressure him. Me and Brother Rashad looked at each other and said, please. We said we can't, we can't even pressure him. We have to talk to him and deal with him in a in a certain way, and, and maybe he'll help us. 
This is the environment that we're facing. Attorney Everson, yes. let me hear your question, Black woman, to the presidential candidate, Dr. West. How many of you are going to back Dr. West in this election? Let me hear you. How many of y'all, man, are going to stand for this man and stand for what's right? And as Washington, D.C. and the DMV area, are we going to stand? I, I got to hear you louder. I want to Chicago in the house. Washington, D.C. in the house. North Carolina in the house. Talk to me. Delaware in the house. Oklahoma in the house. Los Angeles in the house. Huh? Virginia. Come on, attorney. Attorney, ask your question to our candidate. Yes, sir. Thank you for being here. Sorry. No, she can take it. She can take it. Take over. Oh, yeah. That's fine. That's all right. That's fine. Thank you for letting me be here. An honor and privilege. Thank you so much. Presidential candidate. Proverbs 6 and 31 says, but if he be caught, he must pay sevenfold and he must give all the goods of his house. Right now, we know that America has been caught with the income and the revenue of 400 plus years of our ancestors. We know that America has been caught as a thief with the value of keeping us locked out systematically of generational wealth for, for, wealth for years and years, whether it's through reverse redlining, redlining. And so then we go to the point of we've got 40 million descendants now. Back then, they were told they would get 40 acres and a million. If you calculate that in today's time, that brings us to approximately $5,000 to $10,000 per acre, according to USDA, or $1,000 to $5,000 for a mule. So for each person, 40,000, I'm sorry, 40 million descendants of slaves, you've got approximately $200,000 that at the very least should be paid if we're to get 40 acres and a mule. Now, of course, there's a suggestion for a study of what should be paid out for reparations. But if we don't study it, we can look right now and know that a debt is owed and a debt should be paid. Now, we were promised that 40 acres. So even if we just ask them to deliver on that promise of $200,000 per descendant of slave, my question to you is, because instead of, you know, like you said, they've been treating us like the ugly stepsister. America's been treating us like Leah and, and not Rachel. Rachel was the beautiful sister, the fair sister. America's been treating us like the ugly dark sister that they keep in the back. Instead of treating us like that and, and asking for us to give our vote away in the way that Rachel was, Leah was given away, we are asking for them to earn it. So in asking them to earn it, what is it that we are looking for from reparations? What is the, what is your belief? Should we ask for a study? Do we need our payment? What we were owed? How how do we go about moving the needle and instead of dry begging and hoping that they give a little something to the ugly dark sister that they realize we're not the ugly sister. There's nothing ugly about black people. The ugliness and the blackness is not our black eye. The black eye is on America. We aren't ugly people. We've been through an ugly experience. So how do we move from being treated like, and if you don't know the story, go look it up. It's in the Bible. There were two sisters. One was given away because she was a little less attractive. So how do we go from being demanding that instead of being treated like the ugly little sister in America, that we get the beautiful treatment that we deserve? Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, my dear sister. <laughs> Absolutely, no, indeed, indeed, indeed. Now, as, as we was noted before by our distinguished lawyer that a lot of black people will make different kind of choices. I do know some black people who want to just leave the country. They figured, look, this place ain't going to change. I'm going to Ghana. I'm going to Nigeria. I'm going to Ethiopia. I understand that. It's lift every voice. People make their move. But for those of us who, start, who decide to stay in the belly of the beast, I don't think we need another study. We've had enough studies. The work has been done. I was blessed to have a wonderful interview with my dear brother, William Darty on Tim Black's show. Yo, 
We, might have, we had a rich dialogue. Darty has been writing on this for decades and decades and decades, right? From here to equality and a host of other things was wonderful co-author the sister. He concludes it's about $258,000 for each black person, you see. But studies is just another way of delaying. Exactly. Justice delayed is justice denied. Amen. We got to keep that in mind. The quickest thing for a politician, the quickest thing for a bureaucrat, the quickest thing for a technocrat is to call for a study. What we need are executive orders, using the bully put, pit, and then bringing power and pressure to bear by mobilizing the people to bring pressure on the elected bodies. That's what we did in California and other places. Charles Barron, Inez Barron did that in New York State. Those from New York know what I'm talking about. In fact, you know, their Operation Power came out and endorsed me back in December. And I've been blessed to know them and work with them for 40 years, going about the House of Lord Pentecostal Church on 415 Atlantic Avenue, Reverend Herbert Daltrey, the National Black United Front, where we used to teach in Timbuktu, in fact. Tupac Shakur with his mother, uh, Finney, God bless both of them, he used to sit right on the front row with Charles and Inez and myself. And that's 40 years ago. It's part of the same tradition, trying to be true, trying to bear witness, trying to be a witness. So my suggestion would be no more studies, time for action, time to move on the ground, national reparations. We're going to be there tomorrow morning in front of the Wells Fargo Bank. How many going to be there with us? So how many gonna be there with us? We we're absolutely we're gonna be right there. We're gonna hit the hit, we're gonna hit the ground. Oh, what, what's that? 444 four, four North Capitol. North Capitol and E Street, right around, right down the street. North Capitol and E at 9 o'clock a.m. Dr. Cornell West, presidential candidate, will be out to help us launch the sanctions and boycott campaign against Wells Fargo. Nine o'clock, 444 North Capitol. Tell everybody, bring everybody. We're going to be right there and we thank him for lending support to this direct action campaign. So as we are forcing the issue of reparations to the forefront. Absolutely. There is something that is refreshing about putting your body where your mouth Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Putting your witness where your words are. Yes, sir. I was blessed. I just got back from Edinburgh, Scotland. I was asked to give the Gifford lectures in philosophy. It's like a Nobel Prize in philosophy. And it was called uh, a jazz soat philosophy for our catastrophic times from Socrates to Coltrane. And it had to do with making the connection between what's going on in Gaza, what's going on in D.C., south side of Chicago, Congo, Haiti, Brazil, what's going on ecologically, what's going on economically, what's going on spiritually in terms of catastrophe, and what do you learn from the history of Black people in the face of catastrophe? Because, see, the blues ain't nothing but catastrophe honestly confronted and artistically transfigured so catastrophe doesn't have the last word even as you wrestling with catastrophe it's like strange fruit uh, uh, the genius from baltimore city billy holiday she's singing about a catastrophe not a problem she's singing about lynching american terrorism but she transfigures it to give us strength to confront it so that we're not overcome by it and when you put your body when your mouth is like the students that's like right. the students, and I've been blessed to, uh, to spend a whole lot of time with student encampments. We even had a student encampment in Edinburgh. I spoke twice there in Edinburgh. But, but, but Columbia University, I was blessed to be there. In fact, they got me jumping over the fence. That's fence. That's 70 years old. I was doing a little Michael Jackson, Prince, all of it all at the same time. <laughs> Look, James Brown, too. But there's something about putting your body there and, of course, going to jail. And many of us had to go to jail many times. Well, I, everybody doesn't have to do that, but they had to have enough people who were willing to do it to let the world know we're serious about our movement. Go to the next question in the yes, back, my absolutely. dear brother. 
Next question in the back. For those who want to join the reparations movement and the coalition of the Afro-descended nation, go to nationalreparationsconvention.com. Nationalreparationsconvention.com or afrodescendant.org. Afrodescendant.org. For those of you who are watching, for those of you who are here, for those of you who will watch, we want you to take this number, 1877-506-2184. 1877-506-2184. And text reparations into that number. Have your family text reparations into that number because you will participate in the national election, the national plebiscite or vote that will be delivered to the United Nations and the International Court of Justice, which is our formal vote amongst our people to tell the world and tell the other nations exactly what kind of reparations we want and under what identity that we will proceed under. That's one 877 506 2184, the national plebiscite that is being sponsored by the Afro descendant nation. And that's how you can link with this great, fast growing movement. My brother in the back. Yes. Um, my question is to uh, Dr. His wife, Esquire, and uh, brother Lou Tavares. Are we encouraging? our people to vote, register and vote so so we can better support Brother Barney Owen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hear it again? Yeah. <laughs> he speaks for me and I didn't even know he was going to say that. <laughs> Uh, so I think that was it. Uh, uh, that's a clear answer. And, and, I, and, and to back him up, in Message to the Black Man, the great book of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he says, he gives an instruction, he said, put the Muslim program to Congress. But he said we didn't have enough politicians who did not have fear in their hearts to put that program forward. Well, we have a man here that does not have fear in his heart, and he is putting the Muslim program to government. So this is a rare exception, and it's a worthy exception, you know. They on my back. I just say, as long as I vote, don't tell me who I vote for, you know. But I'm voting for this man right here. This is my candidate. Ms. Abubakar, attorney, anything else to add? I just want to add something that our brothers from New York came up with. You're my dear sister. My young brothers from New York reminded of something so basic, but so necessary. They made up a shirt, T-shirt, and they said on there, just because we don't attack, doesn't mean we won't defend. <laughs> Don't forget that. <laughs> Good God, my sisters and brothers, my sisters and brothers, you are you have to appreciate the moment. We are here with legends in this struggle. And there are many legends in this struggle in this audience and those who are listening. But this is the strongest body of leadership that is out here in the public, right. anywhere to be found in the bounds of America. They up here in this room right now. There ain't no black people this strong out here, but they up here in this room right now. And they were on the screen with Melina Abdullah, and we are their representatives. Come on, we'll take some more. Brother Gladell Reese in the back, then Brother Tabu, or Brother Gladell, Sister Queen. I, I, Truth Bay. Sister, Sister Queen Truth Bay, Brother Tabu, then I come to the sideline, and we hit it fast. Come on, in this, in this form. Come on, brother. My question for Cornell West. Cornell West, you've been at the all the candidates, you have stated that the situation in Ghana is a genocide. Mm -hmm. I want to know, 
that when you elected president, will you speak on a genocide that's taking place in the United States and throughout the world? This genocide, this genocide, let me see. <laughs> this genocide is being taken place because privilege is not being talked about because the privilege rates are brought on this genocide. When I got, I, 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 I take your time, man. Let me help him out a bit. Are you saying that, that the genocide that we see is he going to speak out as he speaks out? about the genocide abroad in Gaza, is he going to speak about the same actions that are being taken here at home? We put it like this. You're elected president. Will you take on a commission to investigate the genocide that's taking place in this country and throughout the world? And this genocide this genocide is done by chemical and biological warfare. Vaccines that we have been taking, people are, the after effects, people are suffering marathonitis, um, Pericondites, American blood clots, um, illnesses, all these um, side effects that's happening with these vaccines. Will you investigate the pharmaceutical companies and the corporations that make these people get these uh, uh, vaccines and the side effects that's happening on our people? My brother, oh my brother, I'm glad that we, I'm glad we waited for your powerful question now. Oh, indeed. That's, uh, you got a brilliance. So we're looking at the future when we're looking at our brother right here. We're looking at the future now. Very much so. But remember when I said I had to be and I want to be and I will be morally consistent. I'm against genocide in all of its various forms. You see, the levels of police murder that has been taking place year after year after year after year and then, at the same time, the levels of infant mortality for Black women and Black sisters. These are two aspects of what one could view as genocidal attacks over time of Black people. That's what Paul Robeson, W.B. Du Bois, and William Patterson said when they went to the United Nations in 1951. Reverend Herbert Daugherty went in, in the 1980s and said, we charge genocide of Black people. Now it had to do with the crack cocaine. That had to do with the unbelievable unleashing of drugs in black communities with the guns. And then, of course, turning on each other, feeling rootless, no connection, no love, not, not deep enough love and so forth. So absolutely, yes. But I would say the same thing about Congo. I mentioned the Congo, my brother. Crucial. But the crucial thing is not just studying it, but stopping it. You see, how do you stop it in Gaza? Cease fire, end the siege, end the occupation, and create a situation in which precious Palestinian brothers and sisters can live lives of dignity and, dig and, and, and decency, and Jewish brothers and sisters can live lives of decency and dignity, you see. So you have to do away with occupations across the board. So it's, it's the ending, because a lot of these studies will say, yeah, it's true, these folk been catching hell for a long time. The study's over. Hey, we knew that. Took you two and a half years, three years to come up with that. The question is, how do we intervene? The question is, what are we going to do? How do we go about doing it? How do you muster enough people to think enough, to be willing to sacrifice enough to stop the genocide? How do you stop that with black folk? Whatever form it takes. Now, we know big pharmaceutical companies corrupt like any other part of corporate America. Yeah. Obsessed with one thing. What is that thing? Short-term profits. That's it. Just like fossil fuel, when it comes to ecological crisis, short-term profits, that's all they're concerned about. You see, that's predatory capitalism in a vicious way. You see, I'm deeply, deeply condemnatory and critical of greed-driven capitalism. And people, oh, you must be a socialist. Oh, I'm a Christian and a free black man, but I'm concerned about porn work, and people call me any name you want. But I'm a fight against organized greed, but it has to do with short-term profit and downplays satisfying the basic needs of people across the board. You see what I mean? That's the crucial thing, my brother. But it's so wonderful to have you here, and it's wonderful to lift your voice in the tradition of our people. Okay, let me slip this in on that question. Uh, uh, Candidate West, um, President Biden and the police attacking and crushing the student yeah. uprising. Yeah over Gaza, how, what kind of effect is that going to have on this election in November? 
Yeah, I'm so glad you raised that question, though, because it hit me again at Mohouse when he was at Mohouse. He's sitting there, he's saying, I believe in peaceful protests. Now, I live on 123rd Street in Harlem, right? And I was there speaking with the students. The students were peaceful. They got crushed anyway. Where was his voice? You see what I mean? Sometimes you can lie by omission. You don't have to always lie by commission. Some lies are explicit. Some lies are implicit. You say you for peaceful protest. People peacefully protest and they get crushed and you don't say a mumbling word. Mm. That's what happened. Mm. That's what happened across the board with our young folk of all colors. And many of them, Jewish brothers and sisters, Palestinian brothers and sisters, so forth. Young folk not taking this stuff no more. And you watch and see what happens in Chicago. Where's my Chicago sister? There she is, Chi Town. That's it. That's Curtis Mayfield and the Hutchison sisters of the Emotions. And we ain't got the Chaka Khan yet. That's Chi Town. That's Chicago. Some of y'all knows remember the Shy Lights. We're okay. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna stop. We're gonna stop. That's Eugene record. That's Eugene record. We're gonna stop now though. But Chicago this summer. You watch these young folk come out. Yes, they do. Oh, it's going to be. I'm going to be right there with them, too. Oh, after because they're hungry for the real thing. Okay. This little superficial stuff, that they push it aside. And this is creating, unfortunately, a deeper generation divide in the country and in Black America. Did you notice in Morehouse that the older alumni were the ones who were given the heavy applause. And the younger folk just trying to be decent. Just give them a little small. And I understand the young folk. Let me just throw this out. Threatening. Because it, that's exactly, it puts so much pressure on them. And, and I, this, I deeply understand this, that if they told my grandmama, who loved me to death, well, I don't have a language for how much she loved me. <laughs> and she said, honey, I want to come to your graduation. I want to just be there. Tears of joy flowing down my face when you get that diploma. And then the president says, if anybody makes any noise and protests, we're going to shut that down so grandmama will be robbed of that experience. I would be divided because I want to bear witness to justice. But I tell you one thing, Justice, that's only justice, soon degenerates into something less than justice. If justice is not grounded in love, it ain't going to last too long. And I got love for my grandmom. It ain't justice whatsoever. So I would be twisted. I probably want to protest all night before <laughs> and then open up the place for grandma to walk in with her dignity and say, well, let me see my child walk on the stage after all these years of sacrifice so the president puts this pressure on mm -hmm. and it was a tough thing. Mm -hmm. Is that fair, my brother? No, sir, but I'm familiar with it from Howard <laughs> University. I'm familiar with the pressure and I understand. It's a tough thing. Okay, Sister Bay, come on. First of all, I want to say thank you for running. I'm actually a volunteer for Justice for All in LA. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. oh. And uh, Mark Ridley Thomas, I know you did. Brother Mark, yes. love the brother. So I want to thank first of all, most the bank. Yesterday I was able to, to speak um, concerning Haiti. I'm representing Haiti, That's actually true. as ambassador. And uh, to add Citibank to that accountability, because even to this day, Haiti is paying the Bank of France. Citibank. Uh, so reparations again, um, hard for dying for that. And whatever I can do to support your campaign, when you become president, that is when we want to support with the young people behind you a thousand percent. I want to say thank you again for the work that you're doing and the work you continue to do. We're going to be right beside you on that. Thank so my name is Dr. Truth Bay, by the way. I'm Dr. Person. Truth Bay, let's give a hand. We'll take a couple more. I got taboo in the back on the wall. I'm coming with Minister Akbar in a minute. All right, Mr. Taboo. Sir, Security, economic, 
the border and sovereignty. Uh, economic what about the fragility of our sovereignty? Yeah, those are, those are three massive questions, my brother, and I appreciate them very much. So uh, if we begin by talking about just the, um, the economics, I partly suggest when I talk about disinvestment for military, reinvestment in housing and health care, health care as a right, housing as a right, jobs, living wage as a right. That's a redistribution of wealth downward. So, uh, I got that. The, the central bank digital currency, which I think will put us all in the real economic slavery. Are you familiar with it? Well, you know, I've, I've heard and read about it, my brother, but I would have to talk with you about some of the details. I just want to make sure that it's under the authority and the aegis of not private sector tied to profit, but public sector tied to satisfying the needs of people. That would be my general principle, but I would talk to you about the details. Border. Now, about the border, though, an important thing, when we talk about the border, it's fascinating to me that we only talk about one border. Nobody says anything about the Canadian border. It's been open for a long time. Mm -hmm. I grew up in California. I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, grew up in California, and the border between California and Mexico was actually open up until 25, 30 years ago. And it was open because businesses needed cheap labor. They needed Mexican brothers and sisters to come in and engage in agricultural uh, labor in order to generate their profits, you see. So when we think about border, we zero in that. Why is it then that that particular border is the one border we talk about? See, Americans can go anywhere. I just got back from Scotland. I'm crossing all kinds of borders. <laughs> Nobody say nothing. Whatsoever. You see, money crosses border, capital crosses border. But when it comes to certain people, they get scapegoated. If, in fact, we have economic policies that's taking care of our citizens, then we don't have to worry about those citizens who are there feeling as if the folk who are coming in are taking their jobs or taking their resources or taking their benefits because the system wants to pit those folk who themselves are already on the bottom against each other. And when you scapegoat the most vulnerable, it's almost impossible to confront the most powerful. And we have to be able to generate forms of solidarity that confront the most powerful. And so for me, the first thing I would do with the border is you demilitarize the border so that you don't end up abusing people. The second thing you do is you create diplomatic processes with various nations in South America, Central America, and other parts of the world to ensure that they themselves are able to generate social conditions so that m many of their people will not want to leave. One of the reasons why that particular border is the border that we talk about is because so much of U.S. foreign policy has generated forms of poverty tied to violence that drive people into the American empire. Wake, up, wake us up. That the multinational corporations has been extracting, not just from the land, but from the labor of people so intensely mm. that it pushes people to go where they think they can live a better life. That's right. See, because our destinies are interdependent and intertwined. And we know that the global capitalist economy is thoroughly interdependent. That's true in the Congo with the resources that they're trying to gain access to. But sister talked about Haiti, how do we create conditions under which there is genuine Haitian self-determination with an independence that's not cast as dependence on France and its banks. Because they've never ever forgot of the magnificent courage and vision of the Haitian people that broke the back of barbaric slavery in the latter part of the 18th, early part of the 19th century. And they tried to make Haiti pay so that the rest of the world could see, especially black folk, 
especially black folk. And I know I'm bouncing around, but this is the framework in which I would generate it. You had a third poem. What was that there? Sovereignty. Has the U.S. lost its sovereignty? Who controlled by international? Oh, 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 oh. Oh, no, I mean, no, but I mean, the permanent government of any capitalist society is the economic ruling class. And the politicians just circulate. Polit just like the same is true with mayors. You can have all the black mayors you want in the world. But the permanent government of any city is big business. That big business pull out, the mayor can't do nothing. The governor, all the different governors you want. Big business in the government. See, in the capitalist economy, the politicians are circulating. They're not reigning. The rulers are ones who have the big money and the ability to call into question people's living and livelihood. How are you going to fight that? You fight, fight it first by putting a spotlight on it and tell folk, this is the way in which you're being subjugated and exploited. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, when they do that, immediately they try to kill you. That's why you don't, we don't believe in one voice. See, thank God the anthem of black folk is not lift one. isolated voice. Every. It's every. every voice. You know what I mean? Every, but it's like Luther Randolph ain't nothing with his background and Eddie Fitch and Sister Fisher, Lisa. All those voices together make Luther deep. You see, it, it's just, isn't that true? That's true for Aretha, as deep as Aretha is. Without her sisters in the background, it's a different song because we are call and response people. We're an antiphonal people. And therefore, all of our voices. So you're right. I, I, can't, I can't do none of this by myself at all. But with other voices, you get fired up, empowered, enabled. Shoot. Come on. What you talking about? Absolutely. So, okay. We got final two questions. Then we're gonna allow you to take some photos with Candidate West, and then we're gonna close out. My brother, you, has the U.S. lost its sovereignty? Who complained first about the demonstrations in America? And who complained first about the demonstrations in America? Did it come from America or outside of America? Do you know? Who complained? Who ordered them student uprisings to be crushed? Now I'm talking about these student uprisings today against the genocide in Gaza. Where did that order come from? Yahoo and Okay, I want to ask. So you answered the question is a self-answering question. Study who ordered the student uprisings crushed. It was Netanyahu. When he said they had to go, when he said the demonstrations had to be shut down, it came then to the White House and the police to shut it down. When we just came from the United States Congress, okay, all the Congress persons there, they're on their wall. You're not supposed to be able to put anything up on the walls in Congress other than the placard, other than the placard of the state and your office that you represent. Okay, so when we walked through there today and they all said, all of the signs said, we stand with Israel. Okay, they didn't say we stand against murder, against genocide, we're for human rights. Okay, so, so, so you're asking, has the sovereignty been compromised? But I won't go any further. You know what the, you know who runs this. I feel we the people need to make sure we all know. Okay, but this is the only, in order to, for, um, for, for all people, to be conscious of, of the answer to your question. There's only one man out here right now that can get that message out, that has the ear in this election, that can tell you that America has lost its sovereignty, has lost its sovereignty, okay? So um, final two, and then we'll take some photos, but I gotta come to the left, then I come back here. Come the gentleman here, here, you're the last one. Then we gotta close, we take uh, some photos, and. And then we're going to end this National Reparations Convention. But what a way to end it. Where is Sister Kala, the two? I want her to come before we close. I want to see her. And I want to thank Ms. Tahita Sabri. Stand on your feet. 
Ma'am, Ms. Tahi, let's give her a hand, our coordinator, our convention coordinator. No matter what's going on, no matter how stressful it is, she not only does she get it done, she gets it done composed and smooth and professional. I, I ease up off you. She don't like me doing that, but I got to do it. Go right ahead. Yes, sir. You. So, yeah, my name is uh, Reverend Regine Robinson from LA. Uh, I, current, I just moved to Puerto Rico uh, about six months ago uh, because I couldn't afford to live in the U.S. Uh, I can't afford to live in LA anymore. Family have right. been living there since the 40s had to go. So uh, it was either stay in LA or go to Texas. I ain't trying to go to Texas. So I went to Puerto Rico. <laughs> so I got some. Yeah, that's a long story. But anyway. Uh, I would love to hear how Puerto Rico uh, plays in the reparation movement in America. And also, I would love, I'm pretty sure I already know your answer. What is your plans for a free Puerto Rico? Yeah, I appreciate that question, brother. You must be bilingual, are you? You're learning Spanish real fast, huh? I'm learning. Yeah, absolutely. Because I've got some loved ones that just moved there, too. But I, I'm blessed to actually spend time in Puerto Rico. I was with the sister of the great Abisos Campos. Her name is Laura. She died a couple of years ago, but we traveled to the country together. She's one of the great freedom fighters with Lolita Lebron and others. Puerto Rico has always meant much to me. The great Ella Baker, who many of you know was the executive direct, director of Martin Luther King Jr.'s organization, as well as SNCC, with Stokely Carmichael, another. She spent much of her uh, last years as part of the freedom struggle with the Puerto Ricans as a black woman from North Carolina. Because Puerto Rico is still a colony. It's still colonized and it was taken over with force and coercion and fraud and so forth. And they don't know what to do, but whether to make it a state or a colony and so forth. And so in that sense, it's still part of the United States, but it has a very different status of the United States. And it's a fascinating with a country with an unbelievably rich culture. There's no doubt about it. And so for me, I believe in self-determination. I would want the people themselves to decide, but I want them to decide under conditions in which they already have access to resources. So when I talk about disinvesting for military and satisfying basic social needs of American citizens, that includes even those who have a colonial status but have a connection to the American empire such that they would have access to the benefits. Why? Because they're paying taxes too. Just like Washington, D.C. Taxation, no representation. It's steel. Puerto Rico has its own similar version of that, you see, very much so. I also should say that the um, I've been blessed to spend a lot of time with the Afro-Latin jazz tradition. My dear brother Arturo Alfaro, you know, we, we did the album on W.B. Du Bois. He won a Grammy two years ago, actually. It's called Four Questions, Four Questions from W.B. Du Bois. I did spoken word, and they did all Afro-American Latin music, you see. Why? Because the greatest modern tradition in the whole world is the black musical tradition. That's right. And the language between Puerto Rican brothers and sisters and black folk in Mississippi, Chicago, LA and so forth is a deep one going back to the great continent of Africa. And so we already have rich connections musically, culturally, psychically, spiritually, even though we don't spend enough time together and coming together. And that's one of the things I try to do in culture and music. But, but, but I appreciate your question. All right, we're coming to the final, final two questions. Imam Akbar and Brother Kamal Shabazz, and then, and then we're gonna close in, in unity and, uh, and that's what we're gonna do. Future President uh, Dr. Cornell West, uh, to the Honorable Silas Muhammad, and to Dr. and Attorney Nixon Shabazz, and to this reparations network, I'd like to greet you. Assalamu alaikum. Like salam. Beyond to you, uh, Dr. Cornell West, in the mm, given the black drop or the backdrop, uh, many among the mixed multitudes are saying that the inventions, the sciences, such as ben Benjamin Banneker. Uh, let's say Daniel Alexander, the invention of a folding chair, the layout of the city, uh, Garrett T. Morgan in the uh, 
traffic light situation, filling it in the life of others. Mm -hmm. Given the black drop, all the patents combined, this is a repara uh, reparations question. As they, and give me your best presidential spill on how do we repair uh, from the patents to the land and a full picture of reparations, given your background, sir. Thank you, and I salam alaykum. Oh, my dear brother, my dear brother, that's a profound question, don't think. I don't have a definitive answer to that question. I think we need to bring together the brilliant minds like yourself and others. I'm serious. I'm serious because when we talk about reparations, there's a variety of different forms that it takes. It could take the form, let's say, of the families who were responsible for that, but also they got teachers and communities that played an important role in terms of making sure these minds were so sharp that they could produce these kinds of things. But it really, when it gets down to that kind of detail, See, I hadn't thought about that one. No, man, you got to work with that one on me and pray for me on that one. But most importantly, that we work together. See, that's the thing, that we work together, because no one of us could ever have definitive answers for all of us, that we in it together. And if I had a whole lot of time, I would just open it up and say, could somebody answer my brother's deep question? Because I'm, I'm just limping. It, 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 it's a fascinating one. Benjamin Banneker, let's say, George Washington Carver, we can go on and on. How does one repair and repay that kind of contribution given it was manipulated such that somebody else made the money? i give you another example. Bo Diddley songs was sung by Pat Boone. Pat Boone made 50 million Bo Diddley made 50. So Bo Diddley is broke the Ten Commandments financially, and Pat Boone's breakdancing to the, well, not breakdancing, he's walking to the bank. He can't break dance. See what I mean? Yes, sir. And you're stealing songs from Curtis Mayfield, you're stealing songs from the blues, you're stealing songs from Marvin Gaye, you're stealing songs from so-and-so, making more money in a more deodorized version. <laughs> How do you deal with that with reparations? That's a, that's a fascinating question. Because folk been stealing Man. black musical genius products for a long time. And that's just in, you know, I'm talking about just products. It could be music, it could be science, it could be so many other things, you see. We have, see, once you open that dialogue up, and then all these brilliant minds of the younger generation come in and say, oh, but Brother West, this, I said, I hadn't thought about, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Oh, that's the kind of questioning that we want to continue. So I salute you, my brother, for hitting that in that way. Definitely. No. All right. And, and, I, and furthermore, I want to say that I believe your question is a is a claims question. It's a it's a research question, yeah. and it's a claims question. There there are a multitude of claims in the reparations movement, and I think that where we're heading headed under self determination. is that we're not it's or the federal government to research and document our claims. Our reparations movement must document its own claims, establish its own damages, its own facts as we move forward. We can't be uh, relying on begging for others to study reparations. They must do it, but we have an obligation to uh, uh, assess all of those robberies for patents and, and other genius that Blacks have created. It's on us to organize and present our claims, and that's part of the work of the Afro-descendant nation. So your question is a good question. Coming to the last question, I think Pastor Victoria is going to sing us out of here. <laughs> I think, because Dr. West is a spiritual man, so I think we all going we're going to lay hands hands on him as we as, as we close we're going to lay some hands on him because because we can't underestimate what he what he represents in this hour and and the threat that he he represents in this hour so we're going to sing us out of here 
and then we're gonna give y'all a chance to get some photos, and then and we're gonna uh, we're gonna rest this mighty convention. Last question: the great MMA fighter and our great brother Kamal Shabazz. And before that, I want to thank our assistant, my right hand helper a great helper in Black Lawyers for Justice, and a great asset to the Afro-descendant nation, the Honorable Kala de Ramala Bastes. Remember this, all of the details of everything that we're going and all of these strong men you see, it's always, always a Black woman that is behind everything, paying attention to the details, and oftentimes not getting the credit and they should get the credit and we honor you and I honor you. I honor you and I love you and we love you. Come on, y'all can stand. And she's been standing for us and me for years and whatever you see attorney Shabazz doing, Sister Kala will be behind it. Honor you. Honor you, man. We won't make you smile though. You be, if you cry, it'd be tears of joy. <laughs> All right, so a couple of steps, then we're going to leave out in dignity and in spirituality, because it's a good, this is a great event. Give it up. I mean, this is, this is a great event. Okay, Brother Gabe, you straight in the back. All right, now, don't mess that tape up. Shout out Brother Mitchell. He said, shoot, he ripped my shot out. <laughs> Give brother Mentu the our not graphic man, it's just our tech man, everything man. Brother Mentu, he's broadcasting right now. Art of facts clothing, art of facts clothing. They give him a strong hand, and everybody out there, Minister Naji, the chief minister, brother Imani, who's on the front line. Nubian scholar in the audience here, the legendary from the Defiant Giants in the audience. All of the legends are up in here. All right, man. Hey, go ahead, brother. Come on. Yes, brother asked a question about the plebiscite, the plebiscite that the Afro descendant nation and the reparations movement is pushing the plebiscite, which is an election of the people upon an important issue that must be decided. That's the essence of a plebiscite. It's a, it's a vote amongst the people amongst for an important issue that we must decide. And so what we're saying that this election, this national election is important. It's obviously important, but also the issues that are important to us, we have the right and the duty and the self-determination to take our own vote to take our own election and to use it for our own purposes. And so our diplomats have returned from the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, just a month ago. Governor General Ishmael and Cam Howard was there. Brother Safiwe Baleka, who may be watching, he was there. But we have, in the, in the international courts that are dealing with reparations, they are all looking for us to give a formal consent a formal vote as to the question of what reparations, do we want reparations, what type of reparations we want, and what type of identity that we will pursue reparations under. The nations of the earth want to know this, and the powers that be want to know this, and we have determined that we are going to unite and deliver that vote. So when I'm giving out that number, 877 506-2184 and saying text reparations. That is a that is a vote that we're taking amongst the masses of the people. We're trying to eventually get one million votes. 
And it is a very important weapon in the struggle, and it's also an important organizing tool. Every vote that we get is a also a registrant in the reparations movement. It's a contact in this movement. And so it's self-determination. It's us saying that the issue that are important to us, in this case, reparations and self-determinations, that we are going to organize and take that vote, take that vote and use that vote for what we need it for, okay? Is that understood? A plebiscite is a vote, and we can't just vote when America says, this is what you must vote for and how you must vote. We're self-determining people. We're taking our own votes, and we're going to take our destiny into our own hands, and we will not give up. That's what we're saying here. My sisters and brothers, rise to your feet, please. Pastor Victoria, come on down. I want everybody to grab some hands here. Uh, I don't think the Honorable Silas Muhammad, he doesn't have to. Don't, don't, don't put him on his feet. Don't put him, but lay some hands on him. Somebody, come on, Pastor. Everybody lay some, some hands on each other right now. And come on out here in the center. That's, that's our candidate. Come on out. Come on out in the center, Dr. West. Come on out in the center. Hold on. Come on out, Dr. West. Come on, y'all grab. Everybody grab in. Everybody touch somebody. Touch somebody and grab somebody. Even behind, let's say. All right, we're gonna we're gonna say a word for our, for our our candidate. So let us meditate. We want to ask the the Most High and say that regardless to land, label, or language, whatever God you call on, that there is a higher power, and there's a higher power that is present. There's a higher power that has brought us here. There's a higher power that has brought the ancestors and brought us to this process. We want to lay hands on Dr. Cornell West, and we want to say that no hair on his head shall be harmed. We want to say thank you for bringing him to us. Thank you, Dr. Martin Luther King, for bringing him to us. Thank you for Frederick Douglass for manifesting yourself in him. Thank you, Minister Malcolm X, for continuing to have him speak through him. Thank you for Fannie Lou Hamer. Thank you for Rosa Parks. Thank you for Sojourner Truth for coming through this man in this hour. Thank you for this voice of truth that's standing against some of the most powerful forces in this world. We want to thank you. And as you go out in this world, we want we praying for you. We ask for the power of Almighty God, Allah, to be on you. We ask for the power of Jesus, the Black Messiah, the Christ, to be yes. on you. We ask, we ask, come on, y'all, let me hear it. Yes. Let me hear y'all, let me hear it. Let me hear it. Protect our man. Bless our man. Guide our man. Go in front of him and cut down his enemies. Chop down his obstacles. Clear the wicked ones out of his path. But this is our son. This is our elder. This is our servant. And this is our candidate in this hour, the Honorable Cornell West. May God be with him. May the ancestors be with him. May Christ be with him. Where every principle, may the laws of Maya bathe and cover him as we move forward in this hour. In this name, we say, in the name of the Most High God and Christ and whoever you come for, in the name of all divine goodness, we say, Amin, Ashe. All right, Pastor Victoria, stay right where you are. Come on, come on. I lay hands on him. And come on, stay right here. Stay here. Stay here in this moment. Shh. Stay here in this moment. Come on to our elder, Honorable Silas Mohammed. We're going to lay hands on him. 
We want to thank him for his years of service. Yes, sir. We want to thank him for standing up for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes, we want to thank him for going through the tough times when people didn't understand him, when people didn't believe him, when people didn't know what he was talking about. We want to thank you in this hour for keeping him with us. Give him more years with us. Keep more blood pumping through his body. Amen. Keep his mind sharp and keep the will of the people flowing through him so he can keep on going. We thank God for him and we want him to have all of the blessings that he deserves and desires. We thank Master Farah Muhammad for him. We thank the Honorable Elijah Muhammad for him. We thank all of the Muslim pioneers that have went on and gone on. We stand and honor one of the great pioneers of our time, the Honorable Silas Mohammed. Thank him and thank his wife and thank all the other leaders here, Brother Rashad, Cam Howard, every other freedom fighter up here, that God be with us. And I'm going to say also, protect me. Is that <laughs> you better throw something on me while we in this hour. Huh? Yeah. Uh, we want some justice. What do we want? And when do we want it? What do we want? And when do we want it? And we got to have reparations. What do we want? And when do we want it? Pastor Victoria, come on, get it. All right, all right. Take your seat for a quick no, moment. No, no. no, you want to stay in? All right. Stay on your feet. Stay on your feet. Okay. Oh. The conductor says stay on your feet. I'm going to change it up just a little bit. Because it's the song. And my brother said the word own multiple times. So I'm going to honor in this song our ancestor, Billy Holiday. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh. Them that's got shall get, them that's not shall lose. So the Bible says, and it still is news. Your mama may have, papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own, that's got his own. Yes, the strongest more while the weak ones fade. Empty pockets don't ever make the grade. Your mama may have, papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own, that's got his own. Oh. Money, you got lots of friends, and you know it. They're crowded around on your door. But when it's all gone and the spinning in, they don't come around no more. Ooh. Rich relations give crust of bread and such. You can help yourself, but don't you dare take too much. Your mama, she may have, papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own, that's got his own. God bless the child. God is on. right now. All right, come on, give yourself a hand, and brothers and sisters. Give yourself a hand at the end of this National Reparations Convention in this historic presidential forum. All right. All right, now if you wanna take a picture, just um, just line up so we don't just have chaos. Just line up, we're gonna push the rostrum back. 
and y'all come on down and you can get your photographs. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.